So, so how do you how do you all start this? Do you just like blast into the yeah? We just beginning go. And- we just go. Just go. Uh, yeah. I, I should have all of the drops up. Uh, oh. I also have like several million drops. Please, that I, I, for the love of God, queue up the Soviet anthem because I'm gonna need it. Oh, I, I have mm. it. I that mm. I, I I said to myself, what's what's the fourth drop that I will need for this episode? And yes, thank you. All right, welcome to Well, there's your problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides. I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm the person who's talking right now. My pronouns are he and him. Okay, go. I am Alice Caldwell Kelly. I am the person who is talking now. My pronouns are she and her. Yay, Liam. Yay, hey, Liam. Hi, I'm Liam Anderson. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm not eating this time. <laughs> right. Or doing whatever. Because... Little, unbeknownst to apparently a lot of our listeners, I do work a nine to five, and then I have to jam in uh, shoving food into my gullet before we embark upon our odyssey of knowledge. Yeah, you get you get home from the dick sucking factory where you work, I do. and I do. you have to like inhale. Oh, like in case a burger you're curious, what I do, uh, friends of the show, I'm a glory hole uh, inspector. <laughs> I work for the, the glory hole safety administration. I'm an on-site glory hole inspector. Yeah, you got to put those QC stickers on each glory hole. Yeah, it's a it's a real pain in the ass. Got to make sure uh, the edges are smooth, or beveled, you know. Before we introduce <laughs> our guest, I have an announcement. Uh, hi, we're doing a live show. It's we sold are. out. However, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you wanted to attend the live show in New York City, you cannot. You, you cannot. Can, but yeah, you, you can buy a live stream ticket, and if you're a patron sign up for our Patreon, uh, you will get a link to a recording of the show. Yes. At some point. Also, I should say, uh, I will not be at the live show because it is illegal for me to travel into the United States of America, as I am not a US citizen, but I will be there in the form of a giant projection on a wall. Yes. We will have merch. We, we will, will have merch. We will have Flat Alice. We will have... <laughs> uh, then maybe we go to a bar after. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. B- bring the projection of me to the bar. I'll after. bring a laptop so everyone <laughs> can gather you. around you. We have a guest. We have a guest. Yes, I just wanted to get the announcement. Oh, I'm just going to keep talking out of spite. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hello, guest. Hi. Uh, my name is Victoria Scott, and my pronouns are she and her. And I guess I should talk more about what else I do. I'm mostly an automotive journalist. Um, I'm traveling across the United States in a little old Japanese van. And I write about that on the drive. And I do electric car stories for Jalopnik. And I do automotive reviews for Motor One and Hemmings and a bunch of other sites. But I am not here to talk about that today. What are you here to talk about today? I am here to talk about the long pointy boys that go very fast. We are going to talk today about... Supersonic transports. The droop snoots. We the, will I be discussing talk, the droop snoots. I'll be talking about my large son, the tuple of TU-144. <laughs> that's why I'm pointy. here. Is... Pointy and fast. Hey, mm. That's what they tell me about my penis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hi everybody. My name's Liam Anderson. My pronouns are he him. <laughs> you already <laughs> introduced yourself. I you know. don't get a do-over. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. But before we talk about uh, the fast, pointy airplanes, we're going to talk about the goddamn news. <laughs> this is a good one, Ross. Boston oh. strong. Boston fucking strong. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta drop. You gotta go full David Ortiz for this one. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, a Green Line trolley in Boston has rear-ended another Green Line trolley in Boston, uh, injured 25 people, apparently not seriously, and a nation horrified, traumatized, awaits the Affleck Damon movie that is going to make us feel better about <laughs> or this. Or Wahlberg, it might be Wahlberg, it really, actually might be this, all three. Really, this if was Wal- Boston's 9-11. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> it would have gone down that way, I'll tell you that much. Yeah. <laughs> this happened because Ben Affleck agreed to stop saying the F slur. No, it was Matt Damon. God damn it. Excuse me, I mixed up my Bostonians. Yes, you did. Fanboy? That you... <laughs> no. Fanboy brutalism? Is Fanboy a slur? <laughs> oh, wow. I don't know. Are we, am I starting discourse three minutes into my first episode? 
Not my only lie. episode. I'm the guest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, people can yell at me on Twitter. It's weird that you could just crash a trolley into another trolley like that. This seems like you'd have adequate stopping distance. I guess mm. not. Yeah, I've seen them hit in Philly. No, and just to like rear end a trolley like this is like. Great news, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. I put a lot yeah. of effort into this. Uh, <laughs> listen, I, I mean, c there's what I have to work with here is a fucking NBC Boston article entitled MBTA Green Line Crash, What We Know About the Investigation, to which the answer is, fuck all. Um, <laughs> yes. Like, I, well, if the, you the, have the, one of those yeah. cute little NTSB jackets, Alice, you could go on scene. I would love, but I would love an NTSB because you're not jacket. Allowed in America. No, the NTSB, yeah. the NTSB is investigating. Uh, the MBTA is investigating. Suffolk County District Attorney's Office is investigating. Uh, and uh, that seems like a bit of a yeah, it's a bit much. <laughs> yeah, and uh, one of four operators on board is now on paid vacation. Uh-oh. Well, Did he shoot an unarmed black child? Oh, God. <laughs> I don't like all the right. laughter. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, you can just right. clip that to cancel us. Listen. Listen uh, actually, no, I have one more thing, which is, uh, <laughs> from MBTA General Manager Steve Poftak, his line on this is incredible, truly. The only conclusion we can draw is obviously, at some point, the trains became too close together. <laughs> That's a situation that should not happen. Don't shame my trades. <laughs> it was a, uh, it's, so it was, it's one of those uh, Zeno's paradox problems. <laughs> yes. How, how could this collision occur if the trolleys have to cover half the distance between them, <laughs> and then half the distance between them, <laughs> and then half the distance between them? <laughs> I, I would say I would say that collision is at a point where you are too close together. Yes, in this context, it was uh, Boston's unfortunate uh, solution to the trolley problem. Ram them the fuck yeah. together. Uh, however, I have another. We're gonna news. kill everyone on both tracks. Someone jumped off the vessel. God, God, fucking damn it. it! They're gonna close it. They're gonna close it permanently. Yeah, Alice laid the heaven this into existence on the last episode. Look. Alice, congratulations, you killed someone. Yeah, I did, and I, I mean, look, not this expressing enough remorse. I'm noticing. <laughs> This this should not have happened. The there person became the person on the ground became too close together. Um, no, I <laughs> Jesus Christ, lady. Jesus, <laughs> I'm in a morbid <laughs> mood this evening. What do you want from me? I I, I feel like this the, this shit with a vessel and like uh, whatever else. This is like I don't know. Public art. Uh, if, if you if you make it this antiseptic, if you make it this corporate, eventually real life is going to intrude on it in you know some form or another. And in this case, it's one of the many people immiserated by the system that produced the vessel, climbing to the top of the vessel, and then rapidly descending to meet the ground. Um, yes. And I mean, I feel like this is perhaps more honest an expression of the you know the public part of the public art than the actual vessel itself. Is. And I feel like at some point we're just going to get more honest about the whole death drive thing, and we'll spend our buildings like percent for art on a slip and slide that culminates in a bunch of spears, and we can just watch people <laughs> hurl themselves down it. I call this one the Palisade. <laughs> Put it in the Palisades just for a yuck. Mm. Uh, no, it has a large Palisade at the bottom. If it yes, doesn't I kill you, it'll give you a pretty nasty splinter. Congratulations, you have sepsis. Yeah, yeah. Our, our new public art measure is the something awful zipline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess the proposed solutions for this are, are I think they're just going to close it, because they don't want to close, close it. it, which would be the obvious thing to do. Um, they might close it, I don't know if they'll demolish it, which they probably should. They already um, tried putting up barriers, but it doesn't work, because it's a big series of elevated platforms. It's very right. difficult not to... <laughs> like, uh, be able to jump off of it. Well, if you completely enclosed it, it would be much harder to jump off. Hmm. Like but then also, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be an art then anymore, you've just made a building which cannot be art. The other thing they tried to do before was they were gonna charge ten bucks to get into the vessel. 
Yeah, because no one who wants to kill themselves is about to spend that much money. I was about to say that's a chunk of money. I would go to another <laughs> another suicide venue. I'd pay for I mean, some. There, there, is the, yeah. Yeah. there is genuinely something to this, which is like the, the sort of like study of uh, suicides by by jumping or throwing yourself off of like tall uh, buildings. It, it is a highly impulsive thing. Like yes. uh, yes. th- they've th- done studies that yes. these, uh, having been suicidal. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna kick this shit right off. Uh, you know, a lot of it, the only reason, you know, I, I ever attempted and not the only reason that sort of not being honest with myself, but a lot of it is like, uh, the means to do so were relatively available. Yeah. There are yeah. numerous it, studies it, it that was like, there. it was there. Like <laughs> the, the, the thing, and I think that was, a, was done in, um, Montreal, but I could be wrong. Well, they put suicide screens like fences on one of two bridges uh, and the number of suicides dropped dramatically because uh, even though, like theoretically, if you went to that one bridge, found it screened off, and went, "Well, I still want to kill myself, and I still want to kill myself by jumping off a bridge," I can walk ten minutes to the other bridge and do it there. Uh, people just kind of didn't once that like uh, impulsive Same thing with British housewives literally sticking their heads in the oven. Yeah, once uh, we yeah. started, once we stopped having gas ovens, people stopped gassing themselves. Uh, it's it sounds it sounds stupid, but like if you don't have that sort of impulsive thing there, then which is part of the reason why the vessel is a very bad public art is that it's it's only real sort of aesthetic utility is suicide opportunity. Don't know why they built that in the middle of like the most dystopian place in the U.S. and then were surprised. Mm. Like that would just be the first thing I'd think of if I was designing that. Maybe whoever the artist is, a sociopath. But like, you're building a giant series of balconies in the middle of a city where everybody is famously miserable. What do you yes. think is going yes. to happen? And, and and the views from each of those balconies are going to depress <laughs> everyone on them. Also, I gotta say the views from this thing are not very good. No, they're not. Um, it really is. It is just not a very, uh, not not a very well positioned structure. If you want like a nice scenic view, because it's all surrounded by just mirrors. That makes it even worse. Yeah. All you can see is your own depression. <laughs> Don't need and, to look in yeah, the mirror every gi- day, buddy. Gi- giant, giant blocks of capital mm. reflecting you. All right. All right. Well, can we just maybe we just end the episode here? No. We're happy. We're so we're so we're so happy this evening to do this episode I, that we have. I would like it. I would like it noted that I chose the plane for this slide. It's, oh, it's, it's a Polycarpa Vi sixteen. It's adorable. It, it's my favorite plane in War Thunder. That I I, uh, I play. I do dog fights. Plane. I do dog fights with uh one of one of my girlfriends, and we we both take I sixteens, and it's very adorable. So, and it, look at how cute it is. You can't like even though it's got guns on it, you can't be mad at it. It's it's it yeah. shapes like a friend, as they say. Yes, a friend we with cannons. Ask, we have to ask a question to start. Uh, what what are planes? Um, they are the latest uh, the latest device for combating fascism adv- and advancing proletarian revolution over the skies of Spain. They're um, a way to defy God. Yes, also true. Um, it's sort of like a big metal bird, right? Also true. Yes. Yeah. Sure. All right. Well, yeah. I'll bite. What's a bird? It doesn't have to be a. It doesn't have to be a metal bird. You can have a canvas bird. What's a bird? Somebody answer my goddamn question. What are birds? We just don't know. <laughs> Look around you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're the last form of collective transport that uh, Americans begrudgingly tolerate. <laughs> Only because they but make us you, pay out reason. the ass for the experience, and so it yes. still feels you, sufficiently. You, Justin Rosniak, do not begrudgingly tolerate that. <laughs> no, I, 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 I avoid going on airplanes whenever possible. <laughs> the thing is, Americans, Americans are willing to tolerate them because, uh, as a collective form of travel, you can only experience them if you are like sort of like brutalized by cops for a while. Yes. Uh, if you if you like if we I don't know say quintupled Amtrak police's budget, people might like Americans might come back around on trains. As a as a United passenger, I I, I understand that completely. Yes. If you could if you had <laughs> to be cavity hell. searched to get on a train, I think more people Have would to. do it. Yeah. You gotta beef I've... up the security theater, and suddenly Amtrak's rolling in dough, make it more expensive <laughs> too. 
<laughs> yeah, I took an Amtrak recently, and I was amazed by the fact that I didn't have to suffer through any indignities to get on board because I had never ta- I hadn't taken an Amtrak since I transitioned, and like mm. air travel after transition is just living hell. And yeah. Amtrak was just like, "Hey, do you have a train ticket? Would you like to get on the train that you paid to get on?" And I was just like, "This is incredible." Um, and, it's too bad that they know, only Americans... serve like three cities. I recently tried to take an Amtrak from SF to LA. You know, two very small, you know, podunk towns. You might not have heard of them, uh, but there's no direct rail route between them, understandably. So, East Coast yeah. superiority. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no way. Sad, but... I've I've been both places in the past six months. No way. <laughs> Americans crave suffering, both mm-hmm. of themselves and of others. Yeah, that's what and, makes this country so great. Yeah, yeah. and and as such, w- d- want demand. A system of transport that can like extract that price. A country built yes. on the principles of S and M. Genuinely, kind of believe this. Mostly M. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so, but there's some problems with planes as there transportation. Are. Yeah. Well, they crash. With a, uh, yeah. Y- well, you've crash, chosen. You've chosen they, to they, illustrate this with a photo of. Uh, the opposite of problems. A beautiful <laughs> Lockheed Super Constellation. And you use uh, this to illustrate problems. We're gonna we're gonna talk about the problems momentarily. Well, one mm. of the problems with planes is, you know, they go pretty fast, but for the distances involved, they go pretty slow, right? Mm. You know, your transatlantic flight that takes like eight hours, right? If you're going across the Pacific from the United States. That might be 15 hours or more. This is even worse than the 40s and 50s. You had propeller planes like this Lockheed Super Constellation, and they were slower than modern planes because, you know, propellers, right? Yeah, and had to refuel more often, which meant you had to stop at like Shannon Airport. And they uh, killed Amelia yes. Earhart. The, y- yeah. the, the Super Constellation did not kill Amelia Earhart. How can, can you prove it? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't prove that. I'm just, I'm just, no, I'm just no, asking questions. No, oh, listen, okay. li- listen to me, oh, listen okay. to me. Okay, no, su- just, the, just curious. Just, the okay. Super Constellation didn't kill Amelia Earhart. The baby, bro. The baby, bro. The deep state killed Amelia Earhart. The debate, me, bro. What, what was that? What was that show with the evil car or the the movie? Christine. Christine. Cars. But too. Christine oh. is a super constellation. <laughs> one of the problems with planes taking a long time to go places you know it's annoying for passengers because flying sucks everyone wants to get the flight over quickly Mm. right yeah there's only so much you can like try and drink through it at some point you wake up again yes speak for yourself (laughs) (laughs) it's also bad for airline profit margins you know, if you're if you're um if you're an airline, you only get the money when passengers buy the tickets, and each plane each plane can handle a limited number of passengers each day, determined by the capacity of the plane. Of course, you know, big planes bring it bring in the big bucks, um, but it's also determined by how many flights you can get out of the plane in a given time frame, right? Mm. Um, you know, so with things like airport turnaround, periodic maintenance, so on and so forth, on an eight hour flight. You might get two flights per aircraft per day. Um, on a longer flight, you'll probably get one flight per day, right? Uh, but if you have a shorter duration flight, you know, you can use the aircraft multiple times a day. You can get more fannies in the seats, right? And therefore, you as the airline are making more money. Yeah, we've talked about uh, like long haul versus like short hop airliners before, and how we inadvertently helped destroy the planet because now you can fly from. Paris to Amsterdam instead of getting a train. Yes. Yeah, and, and today we have low-cost airlines that, you know, do stuff like they do every little trick in the book to reduce turnaround time and increase revenue per plane, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but in the 50s, that sort of stuff was unfathomable, especially when flying was still a luxury, right? Yeah, people dressed up in, like, uh, dinner suits and cocktail dresses to go flying. You can't, like... Uh, weirdo reactionaries never shut the fuck up about it. <laughs> I, okay. Yeah. I want to I wanna own that for me, though. I, I would love to get onto an airplane wearing my finest evening wear. I know you can't you should anymore. Be ashamed because of yourself. It would, I know, I am constantly, trust me. 
<laughs> but like airline passengers in the 50s were like people who mattered and therefore you can't sort of do to them the stuff that Ryanair or EasyJet does to you today where you sort of like uh, physically like cram you into seats uh, and like make you pay to like uh, you know take a shit or whatever. Yes. They make you pay on Spirit Airlines for water, and I know this because I got dehydrated and almost thought my head was going to explode from a decompression headache mm. when we were landing in Chicago. It was great. The planes are very yellow, <laughs> though, which kind of made up for the experience, because they look really cool. <laughs> I, love to, I love to fly and to ask politely, could I get a, like a, a small pillow or something? And to be told, yeah, you have to buy this pillow for five hundred thousand yeah, dollars. Fuck you! Yeah. Um, you can have a pillow. And I was like, well, you, you're 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 getting it back. If if you get it back at the end of the flight, I don't. That's not a purchase. That's more really more of a rental that's agreement nice. that we're coming to here. Extortion is what that is. It, yeah, if, if, yeah. If I'm if I'm paying a lot of money for this pillow, I'm taking this pillow, this fucking jet blue branded pillow with me. Yes, made of made of just like paper. And come <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, yeah. It's made of cum. All right. Yeah, flying is unpleasant and it's not good. Flying uh, is unpleasant. Now, one one solution to increase the amount of money you get out of one aircraft is to make it go faster, right? Yeah. So if 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 your plane goes faster, that means you get more flights out of it per day on a given route. Mm. That's right? like there's two buttons you can push here. Uh, both of which are tremendously Alice. They both kind of make it more rigid. You either make it bigger, uh, which leads you down the route of like the 747, or like before that, flying boats and shit, or make it faster. Yes. Um, the early jet airliners were, were uh, fortunate in that they could be bigger and faster, right? Mm. Um, you know, and the, they, they also got cheaper to operate, right? Uh, so, like in the 1950s, airlines uh, shifted to jet aircraft incredibly quickly just because of how much cheaper they were to operate, even though on maybe a per mile basis they were more expensive, you were getting so much more use out of them that it made sense to switch over, right? Yeah. And, and this period provides us with an endless bounty of future Well There's Your Problem episodes because they crashed a lot of planes <laughs> yes. uh, due to the combination of like designing these in a hurry uh, and like pilots and flight crews who had only ever flown propeller planes before for their careers, uh, versus all the way through to like cost-cutting measures, uh, and you know, the, the, a lot of these things crashed, or like got yeah. hijacked because you could still do that, uh, yeah. Yeah, back and, when and, we had freedom mm -hmm. and you could hijack planes <laughs> easily. <laughs> Take me to Cuba, and, God damn it! Yeah. <laughs> and, and just as an aside, I will actually contribute something useful for the episode for once. Um, you know, jet engines were really Please only stop proven. Stop yourself. <laughs> no, I refuse. That's that's literally my entire shtick. Um, the <laughs> jet engines in, for for flight really only became feasible in the late in the mid to late World War II period with the Me two sixty two, which was the Messerschmitt that used jet engines, and it was a pile of shit. Like we're talking about, we th the the Germans threw every resource they had left at this plane and they they lost most of them to operational failures despite the fact that they were like 80 miles an hour faster in air than a p51 um they were like it was very much an unsolved science in the mid 40s it you mm. know the supersonic transport uh murdered a bunch of american test pilots in the 50s and like just jet engines in general we'll get were, to that Oh, I know, but I'm just saying, like, super, like jet engines themselves were like, it, it, it's like Tesla now, where they just keep mm. erupting in flames, and everybody's like, why are you doing this? And it's because Teslas are kind of in the same place like jet engines were in the 60s, except instead of one Tesla exploding and killing whoever was driving it without paying attention, uh, an airplane crashes and then it kills like 200 people. Yes. That's this all. is Also, I cannot stress enough, <laughs> this is an improvement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is things going well. <laughs> well, there isn't your problem, and it's a fatality log, but it's only like fifteen people instead of thirty. Yeah. <laughs> no, but this is like a renaissance for the airline industry. Like this is this is incredible for them, despite the fact that they kill a lot of people because they they don't kill a lot more and they make a lot of money. 
Yeah, at, at jet engines uh, kill a lot of people, but they don't kill as many people as turboprops. So who can say whether <laughs> it's good And or they not? do help a lot of people get to work on time. <laughs> so it truly is impossible yeah. to say whether they're good or not. Excuse me, not turboprops, piston props. Turboprops aren't till later. Um, so but once we have jet aircraft, that basically requires every airline to shift, uh, shift over to jet aircraft pretty rapidly because they just fundamentally change the economics of airlines, mm. right? So this is the first time airlines got more profitable by speeding up. And some of them think we can do that again, right? Oh, you poor, poor summer children. <laughs> yeah. Pour one out for our airline dreams. Yeah. <laughs> so... The natural evolution of this is to make planes to go even more faster, right? Sure. Um, but you have an issue, which is the speed of sound. So, you know, you switch from prop planes to jet engines, that's easy. You just have a bigger engine that makes the plane go more faster. -er. But a supersonic <laughs> airplane requires a whole new design philosophy. And I'm, I'm not, I'm a civil engineer, not a mechanical one. So I don't know much about aerodynamics. Let alone supersonic Once, ones. Uh, I put ailerons <laughs> on the building so that the wind can move up and Once, down. Once you go fast enough, shit gets really weird <laughs> because you're trying to force something through air that, and I can hear every sort of aerodynamic engineer in the audience audibly groan at this point. The air has to get out of the way faster. Yes. Right. Yes. And uh, with drag and resistance, the air is essentially thicker. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm a writer, so you definitely didn't have me on for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. It's about it, we're talking about compressibility, right? Which is why we have uh why we have the slide up. Air is a compressible fluid, right? Yes. Um now when you're in subsonic flight. You're not really compressing the fluid that's getting out of the way, but when you're in supersonic flight, you are actually compressing the fluid, and you're doing it in such a way that, um, you know, uh, yeah, the the air can't really move out of the way quickly enough for the plane. So you know, it, it compresses, it heats up, it does all this other crap, right? Yeah, um, it starts fucking with your control surfaces. So sometimes it just pitches a Chuck Yeager guy straight into the fucking desert. Yes. Um, <laughs> But the other thing it does is it radically increases the amount of drag on the aircraft and then makes it harder to accelerate further, right? Mm. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of, uh, there's a lot of complicated aerodynamic stuff in here that I, again, don't understand. And then there's something fun called the Whitcomb Area Law, which we'll talk about a bit later, but which is particularly important for uh, transonic um, oh, uh, flight. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and then there's, there's also something called the sonic boom, which we'll talk about in a lot of detail later. Um, yes. But you know, basically, but there's first. a conical, a conical shock wave comes off of the front of the plane, right? And um, that shock wave from the compression of air uh, doesn't dissipate very quickly. Um, mm. But first, I have to talk about Chuck Yeager's, uh, because this is, we, we are now into the late 40s and the 50s, uh, which means uh, you are employing a bunch of former Nazis to explain how to make plane go fast. Uh, and you're doing this essentially only this for military how to make reasons. This plane go mach schnell! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, and you want, to, you want to make the plane go mach schnell only for military utility. Um, <laughs> first for like wink, fighters, wink, nudge, nudge. yeah, because you've seen you've seen the like ME two sixty two and you want to do better. Uh, when are we doing an F one hundred four episode? A low bar to pass. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. You, you you kill a bunch of like West Germans with these. You kill a lot of test pilots with these. Uh, and then once you have the the fighters, people start thinking, okay, what else can we do? Maybe we can do a supersonic bomber aircraft, uh, which is what this is. This is a B-58 Hustler. Um, and the idea is that this, like, flies into Soviet airspace, nukes, you know, Irkutsk or Murmansk or whatever, uh, and then, you know, possibly flies back 
home again afterwards uh, before anyone knows anything about They've it. They've never is, really cared about idea. that. No. I don't think that they really worried about anybody getting back. Mm. It was just fast enough that it could penetrate airspace and then drop bombs and then get shot down. And they were mm. like, well, pilots are an expendable resource. Because it was yeah, post-World and War II and they didn't care. <laughs> Yes, and and like air launched nuclear weapons uh, in the U.S. at least, despite the long, long persistence of the B fifty two and then the adoption of the B one Lancer, uh, like still they, they were always kind of like a poor relation, and like uh, you know you ended go- ended up going more into like rocketry and ICBMs and nuclear submarines in the Soviet Union, not so the Soviet supersonic bomber design persisted a lot longer. That's going to be important later. Um, but yes. you can see on this B-58 uh, some of the sort of like design features that we'd come to associate with supersonic aircraft. You have a delta wing, it's you know shaped like a triangle. Yes. Um, the, the wing's very thin, it's very angular, looks very sleek. Um, th- this is not how you would design a plane if you were designing a plane with the knowledge of like the 1930s or 1940s. It doesn't make sense in that context. Yes, this is very, very bad at subsonic speeds. All of the aerodynamics here, until you break that sound barrier, this is all working against you. Mm. Yeah, the, the, and the other thing too is because of the tailless design that all Delta wings have, they don't have maneuverability below sonic uh, greater than the speed of sound. They are they fly like shit, as you said. But mm. just like those control surfaces are not controllable until you are going whatever 800 miles an hour yeah whereas if you have like a a a standard if you like setup of control surfaces those then become sort of uncontrollable uh Mm -hmm. at like at supersonic speed and then you know you end up with uh, a lot of like oscillation and gyration which is like severe enough to the point that you get test pilots getting like knocked unconscious against their own canopy um (laughs) which is obviously not ideal just don't do that be no, built s- simply, simply do not uh, build these incredibly striking, often very beautiful. Big fan of the like uh, the V bombers, like the Avro Vulcan. These very beautiful oh, yeah. designs that could quite plausibly have ended all life on Earth, uh, but did not. And are now museum pieces. We love a plane that does that. Mm. So another thing you have is uh, you have a lot of engines per uh, aircraft. You have very big engines. They consume a lot of fuel in order to create a lot of thrust, right? And, uh, you know, they consume a whole lot of fuel at subsonic speeds for the speed. And then at supersonic speeds, they continue to consume a whole lot of fuel. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's not like a rocket where once you're like, uh, the further up you get, the less fuel you need. It actually gets yeah. worse. It actually gets worse, yeah. The economic justification <laughs> for a supersonic transport is that these People planes gotta go would, places, but really they fast. <laughs> offset their thirst for fuel by being able to make these long, high revenue flights multiple times per day, meaning the airlines are going to need fewer aircraft and fewer crews to transport more people. Mm. Right? You know, you can have a supersonic transport, it'll make two, three, maybe four round-trip transcontinental flights a day, where all a 707 is doing one at best, right? Yeah, and people, people are more likely to use them, you think, because they, they have this promise of spending less time on the plane, which everyone hates. And, and, and even some people thought it would make the tickets cheaper. Yeah, ah, makes yeah. perfect <laughs> sense, yeah. <laughs> you poor sweet babies. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, despite a lot of benefits to the airlines, which, you know, seemed obvious in the, in the 50s, no one manufacturer wanted to take on the task of designing a supersonic transport on its own. Uh, so, you know, there was heavy government involvement in subsidizing SST developments, right? Mm-hmm. Um, several countries wound up building or attempting to build an SST. Only uh, France and Britain, of course, were successful. Uh, but the story has <clears throat> three parallel Victoria's components. going to shout at you now. <laughs> Let, let me okay. just let me just let me just country. replace that. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm going to literally <laughs> drive to Philadelphia and beat the shit out of you if you don't stop. <laughs> 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 I will do it. 
My van is back this week, and I will do it. Well, she would. <laughs> have van, admi- we'll ad- do it. <laughs> admittedly, the Tupolev did carry revenue passengers. You know, there's sort of three parallel stories going on in SST development, which were in the USS, uh, USSR, in the USA, and in Britain and France, right? Mm. Um, but I guess we start with Britain and Faith, France. Hope and charity, and the greatest of these is the Anglo-French alliance. Uh, yes, this was sort of a, a hallmark of something which very nearly came to pass in uh, in international relations, which was Britain and France going, "Okay, well we're on the way out if we don't do something. Can we weld ourselves into one single like great power <laughs> uh, and like be sort of the new axis of Europe?" Uh, this did not happen, but there were very serious proposals for seriously just becoming one country at one point. What's the English word for Anschluss? <laughs> 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 All right, so so one of these planes, of course, became the Concorde, right? And this sort of starts in Britain in the 1950s. Yeah, remember uh, when by, Britain had an aerospace industry? Uh, my God. <laughs> by, by 1956, it was starting to look practical enough for the government to start funding an SST under the, uh, un- under the direction of what was called the Ministry of Supply. Yeah, one of these like weird wartime hangovers. The Ministry of Supply funded a lot of weird shit in a lot of different directions. Um, and it's a fascinating example of how sort of like post-war laborism was like, okay, we can just turn this sort of wartime emergency measure thing into socialism, we hope. Yes. Um, you know, uh, I mean, it's a good thing when people read State and Revolution. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> They read their theory, and we got a plane out of it. That's um, right. So, uh, <laughs> wait does that does that mean that the Concorde has better Leninist credentials than the Tupolev does? Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to welcome to three communists argue. <laughs> well, one anarchist <laughs> leans in and goes, "You know what's fucked up about this is states." It's true. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> they, they I, were, I, see, I guess I would have had to support the uh, whatever English reconquering of the of France <laughs> or French reconquering of England, uh, the Norman Reconquista, if you will, just because mm. that's one less state. <laughs> yeah, I'm I, I'm an anarchist who opposes Scottish independence because I'm trying to keep the number of states going down rather than up. Listen, my political beliefs in their entirety is that government bad, bureaucracy good. <laughs> yeah, the people will, will organize ourselves into small communes of DMVs. Yes, that, but not ironically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um all right so there was uh there were there was a proposal to fund development of um two planes there was going to be this small plane for sort of regional uh flights that would go Mach 1.2 Mach is the local speed of sound right um and there'd be a larger plane that did Mach 2 for transatlantic flights the task of developing this aircraft was given to Bristol Aerocraft Company right yeah, they, they had made up- bombers during the war, like the Bristol Bowfighter. Yes. Sick. And they came up with Sorry. something called the Bristol 223. <laughs> no, Bristol's interesting, because like, like all post-war aviation at this point, uh, like you have a bunch of companies whose only thing has been making warplanes. Uh, suddenly try and like find their niche, knowing that like the inevitable uh, decline in aircraft demand is just going to kill most of them. Uh, like the obvious one that we've talked about before is de Havilland, uh, which went heavily into the Comet. Uh, but even just stuff like Short, uh, Short Sunderland making flying boats and still trying to make those last. Uh, and Bristol's bet was supersonic aircraft. Yeah, and um. What had happened was there was a similar government funded effort in France by a company called Sud Aviation. Um, and they were making these Super Caravelle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, both of these were supposed to compete with the supersonic transports that they both assumed the Americans were developing. 
<laughs> Once again, making the mistake of believing you to be a functional country. Uh, yes, yeah, it's fine. So well, don't ask Bristol, us about our eviction moratorium. Well, <laughs> well, Bristol Bristol Aeroplanes was searching for a partner to help develop their plane. Um, they tried they tried talking to the Americans. The Americans weren't interested. Um, but they found out that only uh, Sud Aviation. Uh, really seemed interested in doing a partnership, right? So the two teams decided, you know, it'd be a good idea to combine our efforts. They also found out the planes were remarkably similar. It only came out later that that was because some of the technical documents had been leaked uh, a while back. (laughs) Industrial espionage for fun and profit. Yes. Or whatever the fuck this is going to (laughs) be. This this requires some approval from uh, both governments. The UK government, uh, the parliament in particular, was extremely suspicious of the yeah, low cost foreign, estimates, isn't it? yeah, but also the low cost estimates and the economic viability of this, this, this plane, right? Mm. But, Which looks like a paper plane, by the way. You see the design behind yeah. the big transparent Charles de Gaulle there, and it looks like you have folded up a sheet of paper. Oh yeah, I mean there was a there's a big um, I and mean, there's a big design process here, which I never I don't fully understand. They came up with a special delta wing they called a uh, OG curve wing. Mm-hmm. Um, they came up with the droop snoot eventually. Yes. wasn't on the first model, but uh, the um, uh, the nose of the aircraft tilts and descends. Yeah, I, I, they did a whole bunch of stuff on this one, right? Uh, a, a lot of this stuff appeared fairly early on. Um, now, the UK Parliament was suspicious, but they also really wanted into the, this new thing called the European common market, right? How times change. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, a great Anglo-French project seemed like an, a politically expedient way to get in, right? Mm. So, the business partnership went ahead. It was organized as a national treaty rather than a business partnership. Um. And the British insisted on really steep penalties if either party decided to uh, to drop out, right? Oh yeah, the British the British press like routinely talked about this in terms of a marriage. It wasn't so much a marriage as a suicide pact. <laughs> <laughs> tomato, tomato, buddy. <laughs> All marriages is betting someone half your shit, you'll love them forever. <laughs> So um, they either finished the project or they both were going to go broke trying. Mm. Um, so this treaty went through. The great Anglo-French project was going ahead. But despite the Concord uh, Treaty, uh, Charles de Gaulle still vetoed Britain's entry into the European economic community <laughs> on the grounds that they were Americans. <laughs> Which is true. Yeah, um, he's, he's also the reason why uh, why Schaaf had to move to Belgium because he uh, kicked NATO out of France. Yes, he did. <laughs> Shall we remove our boys from your cemeteries? Yes, we all know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this this project got off to a little bit of. I mean, it got off to a rocky start. It was rocky the whole way. That's crazy. Um, the short range, <laughs> the short range Concord was dropped because they couldn't sell it to anyone. The long-range version had pretty lethargic sales, but enough to justify the project going ahead. Mm. Also, my favorite detail about this, months-long arguments about the spelling. The British side absolutely insisted Concord, can't, it, it can't have an E on it. That's a French word. We have to use the English word Concord. Shut the fuck up! Yeah, de Gaulle <laughs> kind of got his way on that one, too. Uh, it's Concord with an this E in both languages because big, of him. Uh, big uh, French Chad right here. <laughs> <laughs> they used to call him the the big asparagus when he was at officer school. Don't I thought you were going to say why. the big Chad, and I was just going to lose my mind. <laughs> big Chad. <laughs> so, okay. This Concord's under development. They get uh, orders from certain airlines. Um... And one of the launch customers on June 3rd, 1963, was Pan Am, right? <gasps> Pan American Ooh. Airlines. They I'm, ordered I'm six about, Concords. I'm about to go full internet fascist, just like, this is what we could have had with a yeah. Pan Am Return. liveried Concord. Seriously. Wow. That is just, well, that is 
Such a good concept. Good Lord. Right here is a United. This is a different plane. We're going to talk about yeah. in a this, second. This could have yeah. been the plane mm-hmm. that did 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, oh. if we follow that timeline to its logical my conclusion. My pronouns are she and her. I'm on another <laughs> podcast called Kill James Bond, 9 11, Scotland. Listen to Trash Future. That's right. Yes. That was actually uh, pretty good. Uh, that's like, yeah, that's that's what I've yeah, that's what I've watched the podcast like. for. That's, that's what I yeah, listen to the podcast for. I it's can for make two Alice. voices, and the other one is imitating Roz and my dad. <laughs> <laughs> So Pan Am was the one of the big launch customers. Other launch customers were uh, Continental. They ordered three. American Airlines ordered four. TWA ordered four. Eastern Airlines ordered two. United ordered six. Right. All these Man, American airlines. Half of these airlines. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah say, exactly. Uh, right. It's a real defector. Remember some guys. Mm. I, uh, my grandmother <laughs> uh, worked for TWA as a travel agent. Mm. Uh, <laughs> That's another thing, Both too. Both a job like, and an airline that no longer exists. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> to say, both of those are about as around today. Mm. So, the result of this at American aircraft manufacturers is panic. Just, oh shit, we're, we're going to get left behind here. Concorde is going to become the, demo- the, the, the dominant airplane, right? And if they don't catch up, their uh, American aircraft manufacturers going to be left in the dust, right? Mm. Um, someone in the USA, someone in the USA needed to take the lead, and they needed a big fat government contract to do it. Yeah, you can't, you can't like assume Christ. risk yourself. Yes, you, we, we got to make this the you government, no. pro- the government's problem. <laughs> <laughs> we have to socialize our potential losses, guys. <laughs> <laughs> And President John F. Kennedy was happy to um, <sighs> uh, accommodate this, right, in the form of the National Supersonic Transport Program, which was announced literally the day after Pan Am <laughs> ordered the Concords, right? Nice. That's <laughs> yeah. good fucking time. <laughs> See, that, this, is, this is a good reason to believe that the deep states or whoever didn't have JFK killed, because pretty clearly, like, if business interests wanted shit from John F. Kennedy, they could get on the phone and get it the next day. No, it was Charles de Gaulle <laughs> himself. The press is basically, no. hey, you idiots, hey, you idiots, hey, you idiots. <laughs> but Charles de Gaulle killed John F. Kennedy because he was going That's to right. threaten That's the supremacy of the Concord. I mean, there we go. We solved it. <laughs> we can end the episode now. We figured it. out the assassination. You will respect the French <laughs> from the, from the fifth floor. By the way, he it was actually a really <laughs> odd coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so the goal of the National Supersonic Transport Program was to create an SST a National Supersonic Transport, but it had to far exceed the technology of Concorde, right? Mm. And they wanted to render Concord obsolete and a curiosity of history. Uh, remember when Americans still dreamed like that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Q, uh, Q uh, theme from Pentagon Wars. Well, yeah, I, don't, I know. I, don't, I, don't, have I know. The theme that was from a Pentagon joke. Wars. God damn it. I have. I, I have. <laughs> I guess that's kind of antithetical I am, to the... I am too excited for the Tupelo slide. God. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh. Keep going. So this we program, have the good planes later. Yeah. <laughs> this program wanted proposals from various U.S. aircraft manufacturers, which would be evaluated for further funding to finally create the American SST, the good SST, the one that had freedom and that mm-hmm. would subdue the evils of gay communist Europe, right? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> In my dreams. And, and uh, our, our, our freedom capitalist government would subsidize 75% of the cost of developing the aircraft that won. Yeah, right? that's capitalism. Freedom. That's freedom. Yes. And supervising the program was, of course, none other than Lyndon Baines Johnson. Who right? I oh hear no criticism of. <laughs> America's oh greatest president. LBJ uh, was being advised by Robert the, Mac- McNamara. Never mind. Uh, they were both <laughs> shaped like bastards. My God. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I remember you starting the war on poverty. Oh, that's right. I didn't know they had poverty in Vietnam. 
No, they do. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and we brought them freedom. And it, as, yeah. is Vietnam prospering today? Yes, it is. You're welcome. America. It's all yeah, us, it, all, it all works out in the end, give or take. Yeah. Hey, man. Oh, my God. They hate God. the Chinese more than they hate us. We won. <laughs> so, now... I'm not touching EFA, that. No. <laughs> this was also under some kind of joint leadership. The thing the, is, uh, Liam, Liam has the brain of, like, a Marine Corps guy who was invalided out of Vietnam with a serious head injury, and whose attitude is, we were, le we were winning when I left, and everyone is too terrified to tell him otherwise. Yeah, I <laughs> probably saw Apocalypse Now one too many times. Also, one of my favorite podcast bits is, uh, is that people think I mean this shit seriously, and then they're just like, why is Liam and his counter-revolutionary trash on this podcast? These are jokes. It's a comedy engineering <laughs> yeah, podcast. Wait, disaster you, you of course, you of course support the struggle of the People's Army of Vietnam because Vietnamese reunification decreased the number of states. Uh, yes, <laughs> that. But also, like one of the things people don't know is that the State Department basically wanted us to support Ho Chi Minh right up until Dien Bien Phu fell. He was a huge fan of America. Yeah, which he is was. Why he was a poor a bastard. Fan, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that was a real fucking position people in the State Department had. My dad always likes to point that one out. And it wasn't like a crazy position to have. Just like at the time, uh, in the early 1960s, people didn't think abolishing the CIA was a crazy position to have. And somehow Ugh. we've just gone fucking backwards. Ugh. All right. Is that enough serious Liam chat? Can I go back to playing no. Peggle now? Okay. <laughs> Play Are you seriously playing, playing Peggle while we're fucking uh, recording these? I no. love playing Peggle. I just love Peggle. Planes. We're here to talk about planes. Uh, I heard Peggle. <laughs> so. I just really like Peggle. I just I rediscovered it the other week, and it's, it's better than oh getting my, God, my ass dude. kicked in Warzone. The FAA director, <laughs> who was a man named Najib Halabi, right? Halabi, probably. Halabi. He, um, he, he wanted... You know, he wanted else. an SST Mwah. that was like practical, that could be produced. It should still be very technologically advanced, but you know it should be doable, right? Mm. Um, meanwhile, Robert McNamara wanted the program to uh, just sort of go away. Yeah, right? This is just, what, Robert <laughs> McNamara's greatest crime. Yeah, this yeah. is it. <laughs> <laughs> just like just just ignoring the Miley mask, like sweeping it under the rug. <laughs> he gets to St. Peter and he's like. You killed supersonic American airplanes going down. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. He doesn't review any of the rest yeah, of the record. Don't, 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 don't even like, need to damn. turn the page oh, to see what you did after that. The rest of this is blank. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was redacted. Hmm. <laughs> there were three manufacturers who submitted serious proposals the American supersonic transport. So, uh, when you when you say that, I understand what you mean as proposals that like the FAA considered serious, but I do like the idea of an aircraft manufacturer being like, okay, let's do a silly one. Let's do a silly one, yeah. <laughs> Look at it, it has lasers for headlights. <laughs> so that was our North American aircraft, Lockheed and Boeing, right? So pictured right here is the North American uh, NAC-60. Uh, NAC um, this is the one that was rejected earliest. Hmm. It was based on the B-70 bomber, which was the supersonic replacement for the B-52, which was also cancelled. Um, yeah, they were was, like, we're finally going to stop using the B-52 in the year of our Lord, 1963. Oh, um, I che checking my watch and I'm still waiting. It was the smallest of the three proposals, it would have 187 passengers. It was the slowest of the pre -propo three proposals, it would go Mach 2.65. About seventeen hundred and sixty-six knots. Uh, had these, you know. Worth noting at this camp. point. Sorry, uh, that the Concorde only went like two point one. Months. Yes. Yeah. Wait, sorry. So, how I fast mean, that was, was it supposed to be again? Versus two point four one. Two point six five. Uh, yeah. Ooh, as, yeah. The, well, as the almost. slowest. So I mean, yeah. sure. This was probably the most practical one because North American had the most experience building large supersonic aircraft at this point. Also, it looks the dopest. In, in, including the XB-70, which they had already built. That was the yeah, prototype of the B-70. Yeah, the Valkyrie. Oh, yeah, yeah. An incredible-looking airplane. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Sort Sorry, of did you say the... more B forty, uh, more B fifty twos, Alice? <laughs> did you say B fifty two airframe in use for a hundred years, Alice? I don't know why they always went with V's, but the Valkyrie really occupies the same niche for me in American air, air power as like the Vulcan in British ones, uh, which is like it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a gorgeous plane. It's a gorgeous plane. This is probably, you know, th this manufacturer had the most experience. And I think probably put out the most practical design. That's why it was rejected early on. Um, <laughs> Lockheed. Uh, All right. Uh, Made, I think, the second most practical design. Goddamn L2000. It's kind of melted a bit in the front, is the problem. Yeah, but it looks tight as fuck. It looks really cool. It looks really, really cool. I, um, I like this. <laughs> what? This is kind of it's like pretty. Th it's they, pretty. they have they have yeah. answered the problem for any supersonic airliner, which is how do you see out of the front of it with you don't, which I yes. appreciate <laughs> a lot. So you put your sunroof, head out the though. side and look. You can, just, yeah. you can just pop the sunroof and just enjoy yourself. Yeah. Back yeah. Summer. Yeah, you, put, you, you like hold the flight engineer's belt loops and you get them to <laughs> climb out of the sunroof. <laughs> Ghost of <the> whip. So <laughs> <laughs> Lockheed was already developing their own SST independently called the CL823, but it was, you know, development was sort of moribund. They weren't doing anything with it. Um, they also had some experience building supersonic military aircraft, um, and with uh, once federal yeah, they, funding, they made the they did the planning for the dinosaur, which we talked about previously, for instance. Which the X twenty, oh, the, uh, right, yeah. the 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 early early oh, yes, space yes. plane. Um, with federal funding on the table, though, they restarted development and significantly increased the size of the plane, resulting in the L two thousand. You see a mock up of it here, full scale mock up. This is a narrow body plane, 170 passengers in a mixed class configuration as these very, very large delta wings, which are supposed to allow for conventional landing and takeoff speeds, which was a problem in the Concorde yeah. and especially the Tupolev. Um, it has Don't this droop nose, which has extremely cool windows. Um, yeah, it looks futuristic as shit, like even, yeah. even amongst supersonic planes. Oh yeah, uh, the engines were Pratt and Whitney J58s, uh, the same ones used on the A12 and later the SR71 Blackbird. Ugh. Um, but they were going to make them into turbo fans, right? Nice. Yeah, so it'd be more efficient <laughs> at lower speeds and quieter, right? Um, and they designed this specifically for a flight profile that minimized sonic booms, right? You weren't actually going to go supersonic until you had 42,000 feet, and then your cruise altitude was 76,500 feet. Jesus. God, imagine the views. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, your top speed was Mach 3. That's about 2,000 knots, with a range of 4,000 nautical miles. All right, now you've got me doing the fucking return shit. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even, even, even with a fucking window the size of a pencil eraser, Don't I would care, be right? on this like, plane. I'd be in, I'd be in London in like an hour. I'd feel I, so yeah. great. I would be there. I'd feel horrible, but no, I would have my eye pressed up to that window, like one of the glory <laughs> holes you inspect at work. Yeah, <laughs> I believe the windows on this one were six inches square. Um. That's not that bad. You can look at that. My whole face bad. fits in that. I would yeah. absolutely get on board that, that airplane. One eye pressed, <laughs> just pressed right up against it. So the the, uh, the the oldest the oldest uh, uh, joke in the book. Why why don't they make the whole plane out of the black box material? I don't know that that joke actually is that old. If it requires oh, not, the invention of planes. planes. Gonna be a minimum ni like nineteen eleven, right? How old is the black box? That's a great question. That's a good question. I mean, if you made the whole plane out of the black box material, they would land intact, and then you have a plane full of mush, right? <laughs> but I, I think that my favorite sarcastic answer is because the highways aren't wide enough for it to drive on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, so this whole plane was going to be made out of the black box material. The whole thing was titanium. Nice. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my god. I really like the tail livery too. <laughs> like it looks like a runway that looks so fucking sick. Yeah. Look at the uh, fucking like stripes down it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> they, you know they add five horsepower. 
Yeah, that's yeah, true. <laughs> they had they just had Ed Roth there pinstriping the whole model. <laughs> <laughs> when you have like I don't know four hundred thousand horsepower on there. That extra five really helps. <laughs> <laughs> They were going to make the whole thing out of a titanium alloy because uh, aluminum couldn't withstand Mach 3 heat. Oh. So later refinements, this design allowed for higher altitudes for going supersonic, more power. Higher than 76,500 feet? No, they were going to go supersonic at 45,000 feet as opposed Mm. to Ah. at 41,000 feet. The original design... I believe you could only go supersonic at 41,000 feet if it was a nice day. Mm. <laughs> the higher you go supersonic, the less super uh, sonic boom you produce at the ground level, right? Mm. So ideally, you do it as high as possible. This was designed with the idea that we'd still be able to fly domestic routes supersonic, which we'll get to why we can't do that momentarily. Um, but, you know, it was built sort of with the intention in the beginning that we were going to try and minimize sonic boom with this plane, right? Um, but they redesigned it before the mock-up stage with more power, better, quieter engines, more capacity and range. Uh, and they built this mock-up for FAA approval in 1966, but the FAA had other ideas, which leads us to the Boeing 2707. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is a sort of a, a child's conception of an aircraft. Um, they're like, we're going to build the biggest plane. It's going to be the best plane, the fastest plane with all the cool stuff. And then really, and it's gonna, it's really gonna... wedded to not doing a Delta wing. Yeah. I don't... No, it is a Delta wing. But it's yellow. Oh, is it a fucking swing wing? Yes, it, it has oh, variable geometry yes. wings. <laughs> I like that it's the says Spirit USA. Airlines you know like? Supersonic Transport. <laughs> Welcome I to love the, it. the Turbo Banana. <laughs> you, know what I like? you know what this looks like to me, and I I know why, but like this looks like a land speed record car. Ooh, <laughs> like the yeah. black nose and the yellow. It looks fucking sick. Mm. So okay, to my knowledge, Boeing has not built a supersonic aircraft to this day. I may be no, wrong does, about does that. Does the X thirty seven count? I sure maybe. you can have it, Alice. <laughs> they certainly had not done a supersonic aircraft in the 1960s. No, that's a real um, American shit. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, we'll enter this design competition. Fuck it. You fuck it. <laughs> so one of the ways to combat the issues a supersonic airplane has at low speeds is to make an aircraft that changes shape. Right. Yeah, works great on the uh, the F-14. You can do. Uh, Top Gun shit. Yeah. So, you have swept wings that take off and landing, like here, and then delta wings in supersonic flight, right? This is called a variable geometry wing. It's been implemented successfully on a few military aircraft like the B-1 Lancer, right? It's a really heavy and complex mechanism, but it allows for improved performance at low speeds, right? Yeah, it's a really neat party trick, and also it means that you can have the wings back, uh, which means it takes up less space when it's landed, uh, which is why the Navy likes them. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the F-A-18 can do this too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, okay. it means you don't have to land at 190 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which is kind of a challenge on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> <laughs> Although, again, that's why the good lord invented arrestor cables, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the aircraft is arrested. You are thrown forward <laughs> through your canopy. Well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> they just get you out with a big ass fishing net. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're in any position. Like, I don't think you're at a consistency that isn't going to slip through a fishing net at that point. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, supposedly, the L2000 could land at conventional speeds. But, uh, huh. you know, I wasn't developed further, so we'll never know. Um, so anyway, variable geometry wings uh, were still a relatively new concept, as was everything else in the 1960s. And the Boeing 2707 was going to have the largest variable geometry wings ever built. Hmm. Um, furthermore, the Boeing 2707 was going to be the first wide body aircraft with a 232 seating arrangement carrying 300 passengers. Well, so- I cannot stress enough how weird it is that it's not like, not the first wide body supersonic aircraft, the first wide body aircraft, period. Yes. Boeing 2707 would be the first plane with a glass cockpit. 
The Boeing 2707 was going to be powered by four huge after-burning tur turbofan engines, some of the first of their kind, the General Electric GE4. The Boeing 2707 had an NBA team named after it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Seattle Supersonics. The Supersonics yeah. yeah. The Boeing 2707 was going to be made entirely out of titanium. The Boeing nice. 2707 would cruise at Mach 2.7. And the Boeing 2707 was going to have onboard color television. Incredible luxury. Yeah. Yes. The FAA took one look at this thing that was clearly going to be a horrible nightmare to construct and said, yep, that's our boy. I like how the airplane in the bus. I like how the airplane in the image that you use is sitting on jack stands. I feel like that's the most appropriate way to, <laughs> to have this airplane yeah. on display. That's, that's it's a big special like, boy. If you get underneath this thing, it will kill you. <laughs> yeah. oh, here, here's a fun fact. Since the engines were mounted so far back, you can see there's an extra set of landing gear in the back here. Um, because yeah. the plane was so back heavy. Well, land, landing a fucking drag wheel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Landing gear is famously something that you want to have more of because they don't ever fail. So you yeah. want to put as Why many of them on the, the plane as possible. <laughs> undercarriage out of the landing gear. Yeah. <laughs> so this plane could be an episode unto itself. Um, <laughs> it was, it was going to be slower than the L2000, but it would have better subsonic performance. Um, and some folks at the FAA thought that SSTs were only going to be useful for the domestic market because uh, uh, what was now at this point British aerospace was so far ahead of them. So this is the one that got the funding. And in the meantime, the FAA started doing some studies on sonic booms. I love to talk about this shit because yes. it's, what, it's, it's, it's a great <laughs> example of like it's one of the least horrible, but one of the therefore one of the best documented examples of the 1960s American government just deciding we are going to do some shit to yes. the American people. <laughs> uh, we're going to call it something faintly Orwellian sounding like Project Doom Shrike. Uh, we're going to just start doing it. We're not going to tell them, uh, and we're going to we're going to see what happens. And this runs the gamut from like like shirt and shirt and tie CIA motherfuckers breaking open light bulbs full of anthrax on the New York subway, all the way down to this. <laughs> Yeah, so we got to talk about sonic booms. Here's a picture of a very successful supersonic transport, the uh, <laughs> F40, the Amtrak F40PH. Um, now you can see the sh okay. So the shock wave from the leading edge of this, this plane. This picture was taken on my HO scale model layout, <laughs> where I turn the controller to 100 and watch it go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the shock wave from the leading edge of the pilot down here, really from the coupler, I guess, sort of propagates <laughs> in a cone-shaped fashion. In this case, the uh, aircraft has a very blunt front end, so I would imagine around from the horn, it's propagating this way. Um, at supersonic speeds, uh, this, this cone takes a while to dissipate, and it's perceived down to the ground as a very large boom. You know, mm. sort of on the scale of thunder, right? Have have you guys experienced sonic booms before? Is yes. my question. No, but I, it's on my list for the road trip. I had <laughs> I had my windows rattled by an RAF Eurofighter Typhoon uh, when they tried to they had to like intercept an airliner that they had lost radio communication with, and so they just they just like vectored a couple of these directly over central Glasgow at very high speed, uh, and just broke a bunch of windows, which that's, ruled. That's pretty fucking alarming. If, if I may, <laughs> so uh, I already, on the trip, I've already broken one of my windows in the van, and replaced it with a wooden board that my friends have signed. Um, <laughs> so I'm figuring if I can go park the van somewhere where a supersonic aircraft goes over, then I, they can break the rest of the windows, and I'll have more signature space. So that's what I'm really <laughs> shooting for here. <laughs> Every once in a while, a uh, former VMI cadet will uh, buzz the academy in Lexington. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've been in, I've, I've been at my grandmother's house when that happened, and it was very loud. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is a problem 
because the coming supersonic transport paradigm shift was sort of predicated on almost all flights becoming supersonic, right? Yes. Right. Yeah, For so, reference, I live under a flight path right now, which means I get to hear like jets reasonably, like reasonably often, like a couple of times a day, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. more. Um, I think if I had to hear sonic booms twice a day and I wasn't expecting them, uh, I would develop more of an anxiety disorder than I currently have. Yeah, so you want to fly Washington to Seattle, that'd be supersonic. You want to fly New York to Dallas, supersonic. London to Milan, that's going to be supersonic. You want to fly from Altoona to Roanoke, that's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be supersonic. For all 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, you doing a ferry move from National Airport to Dulles, that's going to be supersonic. <laughs> and this, this requires the public to have a very high tolerance for sonic booms. And it was not known to what extent people were going to tolerate that. So the FAA did a test in 1964 called Operation Bongo 2. Oh yeah, this is this is classic sixties federal <laughs> oh government. Shit. Like oper operation, you look this shit up, and it's like, yeah, Operation Bongo One was like smearing LSD on the door handles of black churches. Operation <laughs> Bongo Two is this. Yeah. So, in support of the National Supersonic Transport Program, uh, and in order to judge public opinion, gather data for insurance purposes, right? And the test protocol was very simple. They would um, create eight sonic booms each day over Oklahoma City and see how people reacted. <laughs> Fuck Jesus Christ. Christ. Yeah, they would just do this so with literally like... literally boomer sooner. Yes, yes. Yeah, and they would do this with military aircraft, because, well... Oh, during just, the Cold War, that's yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, just have, you just have the US Air Force just sort of like, essentially do donuts in your parking lot, but it's the sky. I'm sure mm -hmm. this, this horrified and scared no one, thank God. Well, uh, <laughs> the way that people reacted was poorly. Oh, hmm. interesting. <laughs> yes. So they shattered a bunch of windows, including in some of the city's tallest buildings. They had a bunch <laughs> of property claims, property damage claims, and complaints that rolled in. Yeah, who do you file an insurance claim with? A lot of the Oklahoma air. City. Yeah, <laughs> they filed it with the FAA. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Oklahoma City residents uh, tried to take it in stride for a few weeks. Because this is something the local chamber of commerce had uh, campaigned for, right? Um, mm. But Oklahoma City, a place to fly over. <laughs> yes, <laughs> really fast. You want to spend as little time over Oklahoma City as possible. <laughs> the the FAA rejected ninety four percent of cl property damage claims um, the to the to the yeah. anger of those residents who filed them. And eventually they filed a class action lawsuit against the government, which the government lost. The system um, works. Yeah. So 3% of people complained. And a lot of sources I saw said, well, only 3% of people complained. Of the city? 3% you know, is a lot of people, right? That's a pretty high proportion. It's also like, if you flew a supersonic plane over my house and it shattered all my windows, I'd just be like, well, the government's at it again, and I wouldn't even bother. <laughs> I'd just be like, I'm going to buy new windows now because my country sucks. Mm. So for 3% of people to be so fucking pissed off that they were like, I'm going to file an actual complaint is incredibly yeah. impressive. In, in 1964, like at this yeah. point, com yeah. complaining like, about the government is like tantamount to communism. You, yes. had to, you had to overcome the LSD they put on your door handles to even file the complaint. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, that's worth, that's worth noting here. You you go and file the complaint, and there's two cars, all full of like four FBI agents each following you. They're all irritated as shit about the sonic booms as well. And you're just like, this is a functional country. But your complaint also doesn't make any sense because of the LSD. You're like, right. well, you, you flew your plane over my house, and now my my uh, my my kitchen table is turned into a giant lizard. What the hell? <laughs> Sir, sir, this is the claims line for Windows. 
tables that turn into lizards is lane three, sir. <laughs> please, please do not get combative, sir. Just, just like like the um the line of people coming out of the building meme, but it's for like various CIA uh, operations domestically, <laughs> Com- domestic gladio compensation forms. Yeah, this is the MK Ultra line, buddy. You're gonna have to. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Now, was this? Were you like uh, permanently uh, rendered deranged by MK Ultra or MK Naomi? Because they are different projects, so they're different forms. No, I'm here to claim damages for injuries sustained in Castro assassination attempts. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, jabbed myself with a needle full of cyanide, and, my, and all my facial hair fell out. <laughs> Can I get that? Oh, that's please? the radiological. Oh my department. god! Uh, which we need which, to like uh, we need to Liam. set up every trans woman <laughs> as yes. as as dictator of a communist country, so that the CIA puts thallium salts in our shoes to try and make our facial hair fall out. Does that work? Because I'm about to go try that. Uh, yes, but you would also get many cancers. I mean, I already smoke cigarettes. It's fine. <laughs> so. A lot of people complained about the sonic boom. Some further concerns were raised by environmentalists, right? High altitude planes were going to destroy the ozone layer. Ugh. And water vapor from the engines was going to create a permanent cloud layer and a gloom across the planet. Yeah, which, the contrails. Exactly. These fears were partially founded. Um, the nitrous oxides from the exhaust would probably harm the ozone layer. Um, that could be solved by going to low sulfur fuel um but it was uh, unlikely that the planes were going to have a significant effect on the climate beyond you know co2 which no one cared about in the 60s right no but uh there was there was some some strong grassroots opposition to these supersonic transport planes which is going to become relevant in a second doesn't matter doesn't matter because from the top down yes. this is the way of the future Absolutely. the way of the future the way of the future. Uh, this is like a heavily, heavily advertised thing by everybody involved, both in like in Europe and the US. And we see here uh, a big Pan Am uh, thing that advertises the t- the two buttons you can press. You either make the plane bigger with the seven four seven, or you make it faster with the supersonic transport. And they uh, were holding both of those buttons down mm-hmm. at the same time. And the seventies were going to be a time of uh, like unbridled prosperity and progress, and no one was ever going to feel any malaise. Ha! Huh. Yeah, you're gonna get you're gonna get your uh, you're gonna get your Lockheed L two thousand. You're gonna get across the Atlantic yeah. in uh, in like uh, you're gonna you're gonna get to London in time for the breakfast you just had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Does I mean, going up, it's did coming down. I, I I've put this I put the next slide on here too, which is like uh I, I believe a sort of contemporary piece of uh retro futurist art. Um and it's like, yeah, no, this was this was kind of accepted. Everybody just thought this was like the way of the future. Okay, some people yeah. in Oklahoma hate it, but like since when do what people in Oklahoma think about anything? <laughs> since when does that matter? Uh you know, we're the people who matter, the people who live in like New York or London, and we Absolutely expect that the thing that has already happened, uh, not that not that far previously with jets, is just going to repeat itself uh, because we we believe strongly in like uh, incredibly fast progression of technology. We're about to go to the fucking moon. You can't. You're you're telling me that we're not going to be able to like have breakfast in London and then the same breakfast again in Los Angeles on the same day. Well, actually, um, now that I think about it, if you had like the really fast SSTs. Cause, Cause, you could do two breakfasts with Concord, but hmm. you could leave after lunch and then have breakfast oh, in yeah. an L two thousand. Oh yeah, <laughs> just outpace the international dateline and have never ending breakfasts you around the world. You can go back in time in one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just gonna say that airplane that you have posted a picture of is remarkably phallic. That was all. That's yes. uh, that's retro futurism. That's what it is. It's all dicks. Uh, it's all dicks all the way down. You can tell that it's been a few weeks I've been in LA <laughs> in an empty house and, you know, just like Big Chrome Dong, baby. It's a Big Chrome Dong. Hauntology is when you draw a Big Chrome Dong, but it's also when you see a spooky ghost. Um, <laughs> and the spooky ghost that we are seeing Those are here, also in the house I'm staying in. It's great. What, spooky ghosts? Nice. Oh yeah. Uh, it's, 
It's been around since the 20s. Somebody's died in this place. <laughs> the spooky ghost here is a like the possibility of improvement and of like technological horizons not just remaining constant but expanding. Um like I, I can't stress enough that he went to the moon. The moon in the fucking sky. Yes. Uh, okay, there was not much up there that was <laughs> interesting, but like the 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 moon. You could open it when you, there was a, there was a guy up there. Right. They put a guy up there, and then that guy came home, and he wasn't like weird. He wasn't like a moon guy. He was just a guy from Ohio. Yeah. Like a guy from Ohio went to the moon in the fucking sky. Stuff was getting better and cheaper all the time. This yes. is basically what I was trying to say earlier. I was just an asshole about it. See Alice's <laughs> rant. <laughs> <laughs> everything, everything was going to keep getting better forever. And then. And then. And then. And then Florida. <laughs> and Florida. <laughs> Florida. <laughs> no, this is still, this is still, this is still everything getting better forever. Um, this is a, a slide that I put in about the sort of the infrastructure that was getting built to to support supersonic uh, airliners. Um, so basically, you want to fly over water as much as possible, both because that kind of like dampens the sonic booms, and also because people don't typically live on water, so you're you know. You are booming over stuff that nobody cares about, uh, unlike stuff that stuff like Oklahoma City, which people in Oklahoma City care about at least. Um, so you end up with these plans to build huge new airports uh, with longer runways to accommodate uh, landing at very high speeds and takeoff at very high speeds, and they were going to be like over water. Um, Los Angeles was going to get a second airport on an artificial island. And it was going to be connected to LAX by a tunnel. Uh, London was going to get a new airport in the Thames Estuary, uh, an idea which has since you know kind of been at attempted to be resurrected. Yep. Uh, uh, the Pan Am terminal at JFK was going to like more than double in size. There were going to be entirely new uh, like hubs in Montreal and Kansas City. Um, Mirabel Airport is an episode I want to do something. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, and Air France built a whole new airport entirely for Concorde flights uh, at what was a village outside of Paris called Roissy, uh, because Orly Airport just didn't have the, the ability to handle it, and uh, Roissy became uh, Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. Um, but the funniest of these, and the art for this slide, is Miami International Airport, uh, who you can see here. Uh, in 1968, were getting ready for tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's cute for Miami. They were getting ready for tomorrow <laughs> because what tomorrow was going to be was you make Miami uh, in you know South Florida a lot of water, uh, both internally and externally, so it's easier to fly over quietly. You're going to make that the hub for the whole fucking hemisphere. You can see this map on the right hand side. You're going to be able to fly from Miami to Buenos Aires or to Seattle. Uh, you, you're going to be able to get a direct flight Miami to London um, in four hours. <laughs> yeah, and we will we will hear more of Miami International Airports. Uh, Brand new jet port site later. So, uh, meanwhile, they're still chugging along with the Concorde, right? Um, and a lot of the retrospective narrative of the Concorde has it doing really badly from the start, which isn't strictly true. You know, sales were anemic, but most airlines didn't start canceling orders until the 70s, right? Um, you know, in the meantime, things were looking up for a plucky uh, British Aerospace Corporation. Uh, they had gone from Bristol Aerospace Corporation to British Aerospace Corporation, but cleverly mm. they kept the acronym BAC. Don't have to you change know. the signs. Yeah, exactly. You want to save money on that. <laughs> First prototype was up in the air by '69, uh, and nice. two prototypes were make two prototypes were making demonstration flights by 1971. Concorde seemed to be practical, safe, and most importantly, it was in the air. But um. You know, in the meantime, some issues had cropped up. Uh, a lot of countries who had been horrified by the results of Operation Bongo 2 uh, decided, we're just going to ban supersonic flights in our airspace, right? Hmm. So 
some of the potential markets for Concord dwindled, right? Eventually down to almost exclusively transatlantic flights. Um, Because flying too far inland was impractical because when you slowed down, you had very high fuel consumption, right? Uh, So airlines started dropping orders, uh, starting really in 1973. And uh, by 1975, other than... Oil crisis. Everybody's (laughs) worried about the price of fuel even more. Oh yeah, I mean the price of fuel was going up, so yeah, you can't you can't eat. once once we're like, well, we can't fly these planes as efficiently as we could. Um, you know, <laughs> so it's you like, mean well, that American Airlines and Pan Am weren't interested in the hemicuda of the skies? <laughs> <laughs> um, by 1975, other than British Air and Air France, only uh, CAAC in China and Iran Air wanted Concords. Iran Air is an interesting one. This is like uh, about the same time that the Shah was having Orson Welles narrate a history of Persia. Uh, just really, really into like giant sort of Marie Antoinette prestige projects, uh, which would uh, become not backfire. Goddamn it! Yeah, would not would not enrage a lot of people. <laughs> also, apparently, that Green Line trolley from way earlier in the episode was mm-hmm. going thirty in a ten. Oh, that's, bad. that's bad. Mm, yeah. That's my favorite thing to do in train simulators is speed. Because it, nobody can arrest me for it, but it feels no, really yeah. illegal. Iran yes. Iran in the 70s is like doing procurement like this is the same reason why the the Islamic Republic of Iran Air Force is still operating F14s to this day. <laughs> this captain Yeah, Iran Air has like a bunch of weird aircraft too. Like they own a bunch of like little t tiny 747s like they're 747s but they're short <laughs> um so in addition to this of course operation bongo 2 had resulted in the loss of support for the sst program from one of its biggest supporters u.s senator mike uh bonroney who was a senator from o- uh, oklahoma um you know, ban, uh, the, the, the proposed ban on supersonic aircraft had a lot of popular support. Um, Boeing, in the meantime, was trying to press on with the 2707. Um, engineers there were especially enthusiastic about it, and it took up the bulk of the civil aviation division's energy, right? If you got assigned to a boring project like the 747, that was a demotion. Um, <laughs> I will just say for the record, I, I, so I'm in LA right now for my, my trip. And I went to whatever beach is at the end of the LAX runway, and a 747 flew over me. Mm. And it was completely a religious experience. I cannot fathom, like, getting assigned to the 747 being like, well, this sucks. Well, this <laughs> sucks. I wanted to work on the, I wanted to work I on mean, the 2707. God. Yeah, I mean, my God, it was just the coolest shit I've ever seen. So that's my little aside. Um. They started encountering a lot of design difficulties. Um, in 1968, they scrapped the variable geometry wings. They scaled down the plane to a 230-seater. Um, sales were strong, though. Project looked likely to succeed, despite at this point being about two years behind schedule. Um, and this program was supported by uh, President Nixon, by the Republicans, by people of Seattle, and very much supported by organized labor, you know, because we're in this sort of sort of weird Nixon era, you know? Yeah, hot um, riot shit. Yes, exactly. And um, while the prototypes were under construction, they were actually putting together airplanes. In March 1971, the U.S. Senate voted to cut funding. Um, and with the sort of simultaneous downturn in commercial aviation orders in general, Boeing had to lay off 60,000 employees. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. That's nuts. But Boeing and was. Seattle was like a, a company town for mm-hmm. Boeing, basically. Yeah, it was, right? it was just Boeing. Um, right. They didn't have Amazon yet. Um, Oof. This, was, uh, this is known, known today in Seattle as uh, the Boeing bust. Um, and it wrecked Seattle's economy for decades and resulted in sort of mass exodus of population people went out to try and find jobs elsewhere uh this billboard was put up outside of town famously that says will the last person leaving seattle please turn out the lights 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, could have could have turned into like aerospace Detroit, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, especially, you know, with increased automation in the industry and with Boeing trying to set up those non-union plants now, it hasn't really bounced back. There's not, you know, there's not blue collar airplane jobs in Seattle quite the way there used to be. Um <laughs> need to bring back like hand riveting. Yeah, exactly. So the 2707 was definitively dead. By 71. F. F. And uh, Alice, this is your slide. Yes. yes. So the remember Miami International Airport's new shiny jet port? Their plan yes. was uh, that in order to like achieve maximum quietness, they were going to get it as, as, as far over water as you could by putting a gigantic airport in the middle of the fucking Everglades. Uh, this was not very popular amongst environmentalists, but they got a reprieve in that they built one massive runway, uh, and then nothing else. Because by this point, <laughs> the um, like all of the infrastructure started to collapse, right? Um, so most of the like brand new airports never got built. You may notice that Los Angeles does not have an airport on an artificial island. Uh, yes. London does not have an airport in the Thames estuary. A lot of the expansions never got built. The only real like successful airport that was built for supersonic airliners uh, is Paris Charles de Gaulle. Um, in Miami, they built this thing in essentially the middle of nowhere, because the transport links were going to be trivial once you had a, a plane that was that fast. Uh, without that, you just have a, like, a single very long runway in a swamp. Uh, which is, it's, it's still there. This is a picture yeah. of it now. Um, it, it's used for nothing. I thought they used it for training sometimes. Sometimes. There's also been a pitch by, uh, by local politicians to try and do like an equivalent of the Paris air show there in the middle of a swamp. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, th- this has not really captured anyone's imagination. Uh, sometimes wow. like a I Cessna- crashed and survived, but it was then eaten by a gator. Yeah, yeah. Great. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, sometimes, like a Cessna emergency happens, lands yeah. there. It's called a Dade Collier Transitional and Training Airfield now. Um, That's where you go if you want to be a, a trans pilot. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is this is I don't know. There is a spooky ghost in this image. I think yes, because this could have been the uh, the jet port. This could have been your hub to travel from fucking Buenos Aires to Manila. You know. Um, and instead, it's it's a field and a swamp. There is a phone number there on a road sign, which I feel like I should prank call. Be like, "Hi, I have a Concord. Can I please land here?" Like, <laughs> time is of the essence. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. You'll probably get arrested. I was about to say, you call in, you call in, and you say, "I'm I'm trying to land a." A Pan Am L2000. <laughs> Be like, what parallel universe did you fly in from? A better one. <laughs> mm. Speaking of better universes, uh, we have welcome a f- to the Soviet Union. Oh, thank God. The part that you had me on the podcast for. What is this? Tell us about our beautiful boy. What are we looking uh, at here? God, this is this is the Tupolev Tu144. And it, it droops the snoots and it floops the canards. I, I don't really <laughs> think that there's much else that needs to be said, but I will say it was the first supersonic transport. So fuck you, France and Britain. Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, it was faster. It went Mach 2.15 versus 2.04. It was longer. It was wider. It wasn't as heavy. It was more fuel efficient. It seated 20 more people. And again, just, you know, and this is Alice exclusionary when I say this, because, you know, I, I love Alice, but also fuck love you the too. Brits. Fuck the Brits. <laughs> um, so they were going to develop this in the 60s when the Concorde was being developed, and they were rushing to make it both ahead of the Concorde and the 60th anniversary gift to communism, which I'm sure you've never covered before on this show. <laughs> but when the Russians tend to rush projects for when, when they communism, pick an arbitrary date, yeah, it, when they pick an arbitrary date and they're like, "This is a gift to communism," 
it leads to developmental flaws. And they, the T one four four, they love communism too much. They try and give it too many gifts. They do. They really do. I have an ex like that. My God, <laughs> communism is not going to appreciate you as much if you give her a flawed product as opposed mm-hmm. to a good one. That's right. Yeah, you gotta put and, in the time and the thoughts. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that was the T one four four, right? Is like. Uh, granted, the Concorde is a better plane. Um, the The flaws of this are uh, the Soviet Union, as you may have noticed, is mostly land. It's hmm. not a place you can fly supersonic travel over an ocean. And so you run into the same problems the FAA did in Oklahoma City, where you shatter windows. Um, yeah, because the also- Soviet Union by this point had been captured by revisionist apparatchiks who did not take the correct line to people complaining about sonic boom shattering all of their windows, exactly. which is to have them shot by the KGB. Yes. Exactly, yes. exactly. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that was a problem off the bat. Uh, it also was so loud inside that you couldn't talk to other passengers, but both because Good. it it had, the after- <laughs> <laughs> it had the afterburners on for the whole flight. So the Concorde uh, used afterburners to get in the air and then turned them off once you were kind of at supersonic speed. The, the, the Tupolev did not require that. It required supersonic. How? For, for yes. supersonic flight, it needed afterburners on the whole time. So you were passing Can't notes to people in the, the same... <laughs> in over the, the same sound of row. the engine noise. <laughs> good good um, I Soviet made a, plane, make engine bigger. <laughs> I made a joke in one of my car reviews about a car being louder than the economy rose with this airplane. Because it was, <laughs> it was like literally deafening. You had to bring airplugs or you might go deaf. Um, and... Uh, there was no commercial luxury air travel in the USSR at the time because didn't I mean theoretically like you didn't have classes there wasn't somebody who was mm. going to be like I'm a rich fancy person I'm going to take a, a supersonic plane instead of a normal subsonic aircraft and you already have jets this time so what point does this serve really um, and the other thing too is that it kind of sucked so it had 181 flight hours total before it was retired over 103 flights. And it had 226 operational issues at that during that period. I think <laughs> somewhere around 70 of those would have destroyed the airplane. Um, they discovered a decent number of them on the ground, but uh, it wasn't great. No, you don't uh, want to. You don't want to be experiencing a brand new mechanical issue in a brand new type of aircraft. There was uh, going very, very fast. There was actually a flight. Well, There's only pilot- a few seconds for you to experience it, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. There was actually a flight where a uh, pilot recounted there were a bunch of journalists from the West on board, and 22 out of 24, or something like that. Uh, like warning lights came on basically like land the plane now <laughs> you're gonna die Check. the air horn <laughs> sirens came on on board I, I, and I, I they am just simply were like screaming <laughs> to my flight engineer <laughs> vitali what is check engine light and he can't hear me i'm screaming i'm screaming he is screaming <laughs> yeah so so they ended up landing that flight after 75 minutes with a pillow stuffed into the air horn on board the plane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. That is legitimately what happened. Um, yeah, and you because... have to pay for the pillow under capitalism, so who's to say whether it's worse? <laughs> good point, yeah. That's a good point, Alice. <laughs> so, I mean, it wasn't exactly great. Uh, the it's the other thing, Soviet too, is so pillow like. pillow is made of hair of bear. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, too, is like. The, it, it it flew regular service, so I mean it does count as the first supersonic transport. It beat the Concorde by a few months, yeah. Um, but it only flew like once a week of, over a two hour route with never a full plane. It flew with an average of fifty three passengers because they were terrified that this plane was going to disintegrate in midair basically they were just like 53 passengers all of whom have like either lost bets or badly (laughs) pissed off their boss it's like the chernobyl liquidators when you 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 enter the plane (laughs) i serve the soviet (laughs) union (laughs) yeah you you get off this plane alive and somebody gives you a collected works of lenin box set yeah it, it was very much a a uh it was really cool. I mean, I love this airplane. Like, I, I should I should note while I'm talking about this that like 
I adore this aircraft because I love Soviet engineering because a lot of it is so shitty and it's so close to being so good. And the Tupolev 2U144 is exactly that example. It is, it is so close to being such an incredibly good airplane. If they had spent six more months on this thing, they would have made it absolutely phenomenal. But they didn't because they were the the inherent problems with the command and control economy uh, that the Soviet Union had was just get this plane done. And so they got the plane done. <laughs> Welcome back. That happened at the episode. Don't say third. Thanks. Yeah, Super um, show. Have a good night. <laughs> another problem they had with it was it had uh, what was considered advanced for the time. It had very large segments of airframe. So normal aircraft, you know, when they fly to 60,000 feet, and then land again, you're going to develop some cracking. And that's normal to an extent. And you repair those as needed. But uh, it's something that you kind of develop your aircraft structure to mitigate so that you don't need to get like a six inch crack and then ground your entire aircraft fleet for six months. Mm -hmm. Uh, They didn't do that with this. So it had nine foot slabs of airframe that would crack. And because there were no splits in the airframe structure, it would just split all the way down the side. I, so I you're am, flying I, I'm aircraft. stuffing more pillows into the air horn, <laughs> trying right. to like scream at my co-pilot, and I'm I'm seeing daylight through the floor. <laughs> I got that. It was my dad absolutely. had a '63 Bel Air where you could do that. <laughs> I, got like the, was, I got like the highway repair tar truck just spewing tar <laughs> all over you the know, plane. And the thing is, like, I love Ladas. I love uh, the mm. Volga Gaz 2410. You know, they're great cars for the economy that they were developed under this plane was those except it went supersonic and flew at 60,000 feet listen it's, uh, it's, which it's, gives it's, you different anxieties loud. right it's, it's <laughs> loud it's communist and it doesn't work well i identify with it a lot exactly well we're getting to the buran so hang on um so it, it everybody thought that they stole it the, the soviets stole it from the French and they did. Motherfuckers I don't, still call like, it Russian Concord to this day. Yeah, I know Concordsky yeah. is the most common term for it, and really, like there is some, there are some historians that believe that they saw the plans for the Concord, but like it's a fucking supersonic transporter that carries passengers. It's going to have a delta wing design. It's going to have a droop snoot. It's going to be all of the things the Concord was. It wasn't all that similar in development. They might have seen the plans and been like, delta wings are cool. And that's about as far as it went. Um, the Russian, the, the Soviet military thought about using them as a bomber until they realized they sucked shit. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then they because retired the, the, the plane. Soviet, it, yeah, the oh, Soviet Air Force used a lot more, uh, like I mentioned this earlier, used a lot more supersonic bombers. Uh, yeah. Tupolev made a couple of different ones for them. Uh, yeah. Also, also uh, Sukhoi and the Ashes Chef. We only had what? We had the B1, the B2, B52 uh, is subsonic. <sighs> We had, you also had the B fifty eight before B58, that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the off Russian the top of my head, it's just the TU one hundred and sixty and the TU twenty two. Mm. Okay, yeah, I think um, that's right. Um, the Russian Federation really... still uses a, a bomber that's very similar looking to this, if I recall correctly. Oh yeah, and they I still they also sure still they use know. the Bears. They still use like uh, turboprop bombers. Good so, for yeah. them, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's based yeah, in this so because you, it was Grosny. it was genuinely a, a flawed design, right? Like, I mean, you can't yeah, have a super, are. I mean, you can't have a supersonic plane that you can't talk to your other passengers in. Um, Again, the that's other thing the too ideal. is like even the air conditioning was so loud that you couldn't talk to each other when that was on because the stresses on the airframe required really strong air conditioning, and the Soviets were like. Well, just make it blow louder, <laughs> and that was their solution <laughs> to the whole problem. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't ideal. Uh, it, it was retired in eighty three after it had two crashes. One was with six people on board, I believe, um, who were all flight crew. It it just it had a fuel problem. It leaked. They ditched it. the The nose folded up into the cockpit, and they all died. Oh, um, and then the other one was during the uh, Paris Air Show of eighty. God, I should have written this down. 73. Uh, 73. 73, yeah. Sorry, my apologies. Um, that was the French's fault. That was, wait. Yeah, no, that, that was the French's fault. So there was, the, the T-144 was flying at the, the Paris Air Show to show off that the Soviet model was going to develop incredible airplanes. And a French Mirage jet that went to take pictures of 
the TU-144 flew too close to it. It startled the pilots. They stalled it out, and they crashed it. I blame the French entirely. That was not the Soviets' problem. Um, that was right after the first round of cancellations for um, the, uh, uh, what's it, the, the airlines ordering the Concorde, too. Yeah, mm, well, the, the Soviet airplane deep flew states, for 10 more years. Deep states. Deep states. Deep states. Le, le deep. That was a very high-profile crash because it was an air show, but like... Well, also triggered a second round of cancellations for the Concorde. It did. It did. But realistically, like, there's a lot of speculation over what caused it. I mean, it might have just been that the, the two bullet pilots were trying to show off and they stalled. Um, but I, I truly think that the French are the problem for this because I think the French are the problem for a lot of things. And I think that mm. blaming them for this fits my moral world, worldview in a way that makes me feel better. So, um, <laughs> and then after this, after 83... They decided they would use it as a test vehicle for uh, the Soviet Buran Energia astronauts. And then after that, it served another 10 years or so in the 90s as a supersonic laboratory for NASA and Roscosmos in the 20 minute period where both of those agencies liked each other. Um, well, I am once again seeing a spooky ghost. Yes. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. It is, it is a spooky ghost period, but they were seeing a Tupolev in a NASA livery is like a religious experience. Um, there's a couple of museums and stuff now, and I, it is like a, a, in the same way that you, Alice, probably want to go to Saudi Arabia, I hmm. feel like I need to make a pilgrimage to a, a uh, Tupolev <laughs> to you one before. And I hope that's not rude to no, say. No, no, just... yeah, it's, the, you, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like looking at a world where the right side won the Cold War. It, yeah, I mean, that's the whole reason why I like the Buran. There's a bunch of people on Twitter that followed me because I bought that nine-foot-tall Soviet Buran model. And it's like, <laughs> you see this future where if things had just sucked a little less, if there had been a little bit less... Uh, fevered competition, if people had just spent, you know, 20 minutes more on developing things, you we could have to seen the a... next slide for the ultimate punchline to this? Oh, God, please don't. Mm. I know what the, the follow-up to this yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, it well. killed the Soviet Union, and it killed the Tupolev also. It's Pepsi. <laughs> it's Pepsi. Look alive, you're in the mm. Pepsi generation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to get off Mr. Pepsi's wild ride. <laughs> That's too damn bad. <laughs> this is a Concorde, not a uh, Tupolev. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's because so it's so fucking capitalist. Mm -hmm. The actual service history of the Concorde, right? Um, and your initial service was uh, not great, not great, right? Um, it was sort of, from the start, limited to routes, which went to countries where they'd allow it to fly. <laughs> All right, off to a promising start. Yeah, so <laughs> Paris to Rio by way of Dakar, right? And Interesting. Ooh, that's a that's a heck of a route. <laughs> yeah, and then London to Bahrain. <laughs> okay, less crazy, okay. I guess. Yeah. Um, the transatlantic market was pretty much off limits because the United States had banned SSTs from landing at airports. Right, this I ban do. was not lifted until 1977 when the London to Dulles flight started. Because uh, New York City immediately locally banned the Concorde. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the, the reason for the ban was over noise concerns, right? right. Now, the, the thing about the Concorde on takeoff, it wasn't really noticeably noisier on takeoff than a lot of contemporary airliners. And it was actually quieter than Air Force One at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Still didn't matter. I, I will point out that uh, the only time they tried to fly a Concorde later on to, to San Francisco, they made it land across the bay in Oakland. This they nim uh, they nimby the uh, fucking yeah, plane. Say, it is uh, literally all nimby shit. It's yeah. it's a hundred percent nimby yeah. shit, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um. So they didn't manage to get uh, after I think a Supreme Court overturned the Supreme Court overturned the New York City local ban. Uh. Um. So scheduled service from London and Paris to JFK didn't begin until late 1977. Yeah, and it was Concord shit because neither of those air airports were ever expanded. Mm -hmm. I've seen a photo of the check-in 
for uh, Concord at Heathrow. Alice isn't which, doing the live show because she doesn't want to go to New York City on an airplane. Right. That's, right. <laughs> that's right. That's hey, right. Like, the booking agent reached out to us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. they, they had this. They had this beautiful sort of like futuristic idea of what like the experience of getting onto this plane was going to be like, and uh, it was not true on like either the airport that you left or the airport that you got to. <laughs> yes. Well, maybe a Dulles. Dulles was still pretty new then. Uh, um, but yeah, that JFK was not. I mean, one of the things I guess that really doomed these uh, jet ports is that Concorde could land on conventional runways. Right. Yeah, they thought SSTs were going to get bigger, faster, like yeah. jets did, and it didn't happen. Didn't happen, yeah. I, I will mention, though, that the Concorde had to land at about 100 and 70 miles an hour, so... Yeah, it was a Sorry, fast landing. It would have been better what had they done normal that. normal planes land at? I just don't know. Uh, normal in quotes. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll edit out the typing. Yeah. Thanks. Um, their landing <laughs> speeds take place at approximately 150 miles an hour, so you're okay. going a, a lot faster. Yeah, that's what? A and, quarter more? You said 190, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, I said 190, and the, the Tupolev actually was rated for landing by the FAA at 204 miles an hour, wow. which meant that she's it could go in slower. Hot. Yeah, she's just always like, coming hot. Ev ev just, every every tire is note. like a flame, and a, you're, <laughs> yes. you're just coming in yes. at a 90 degree angle to the sound of... <laughs> <laughs> it had, it had I'm just gonna note to slow down. <laughs> I'm just gonna note really quickly that the the theme of supersonic transport landing extremely fast with really pumped up kicks is it something we'll have to explore later. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna say any more than that. <laughs> but they land fucking fast. I mean, yeah, faster than normal air traffic does. Which is also part of the reason why people didn't like them is like the actual like passenger yeah, it sound experience. Like a very you, experience. Okay, right, right, right. you know what? Do you know how excited I'd be if two Concords flew over my house a day? Listen, we so you, you and I, you and I, Victoria Scott, are not normal, right? Yeah. No, normal I'm people. incredibly weird. Normal That's people. That's the whole reason I'm on did, this podcast. Did, did not like the experience of flying on the Concorde because the overall experience, like, okay, it's not as it's not like incomprehensibly loud, but apart from anything else, it's a small cabin. Right. My my dream someday is to fly on the Tupolev Tu one four four. I want to go surprised it didn't succeed, just because you figure like. Well, You're willing to make those trade offs? Like, you already well, like, know it about was, them? It was All so right. expensive, right? It was, you you no, would pay I, like thousands I, I and thousands. And, 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 and rich people, when they pay thousands of dollars to Expect fly somewhere. X level of like. Yeah, they want to be sure. able to like stretch out I, and order I like say, the bounty of the sea and like have a machine that no, jerks them I, off. I get that. <laughs> I will say, like, Concord tickets cost like eight grand. Like, yeah. they were not cheap. Yeah. They were definitely and, like. It, it's, like it, it, it's I'm like fancy. Eight, eight, it's like there fast. one 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 row either side, very very small, very cramped, like to the point of claustrophobia. Small windows, uh, low ceilings, uh, and like overall that experience of like you take off very very fast and very loud. You're you're wedged into a pretty small seat and a pretty small airframe, and then you land very fast. Uh, right. That's like different. That that's an experience that's designed for transgender women and strategic <laughs> air command men who are about to try and like bomb Irkutsk. It's not designed for like salary men flying yeah, from Joey London P. to Money New York. Bags, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just built different, and that's all I'll say about it. <laughs> I I just want to be be the contrarian here. The, the Concord, um, you know, as it was originally designed and as they originally tried to market it. Um, it, it failed at its original mission, which was going to make two transatlantic flights a day, maybe more, right? Um, because it wasn't quite fast enough. It was about three hours and 30 minutes for a transatlantic flight. They needed to get that a little bit farther down. That's still that so good, you, though. It's really good, but it's not good enough to actually get the plane to the sort of capacity utilization where it becomes cheaper to operate. Right. That's why it became sort of a... It originally. Tickets were expensive. What British Airways realized later on was that people thought the tickets were much more expensive than they were. Mm. So they raised the price commensurately, right? <laughs> and then all of the sudden, they started making a shitload of money off of it. Yeah, because it was a luxury good. It was a luxury um, thing, yeah. And people would pay a whole bunch of money 
for the Concord experience, right? So mm. it, it, by the, honestly, Concord started turning a profit, you know, relatively early on. And I mean, it was sort of commensurate with like British Airways uh, privatization. Um, yeah. I'll also point out that British Airways, like, uh, lent very heavily on patriotism to try and sell tickets to this. It wasn't just a luxury experience, but it was a uniquely British. We shelved the French part pretty quickly. A yeah. uniquely British uh, sort of like luxury experience. The, the the BA slogan at this point was literally like "Fly the flag." <laughs> oh. oh, that's gross. <laughs> yeah, I, oh I I bet no American airline would ever do such a thing. <laughs> Because we killed it's, our flag carrier. Fuck them. <laughs> listen, it's going to be it's 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 going to be like two or three years um, before they have the first uh, thin blue line American Airlines. Uh, oh, plane. it's coming. Yeah, it's for sure coming. <laughs> but they'll have a BLM plane with it. Oh my yeah. god! Maybe it'll be each side of the plane. You're be laving painted. some shit right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't like this. I don't like this. <laughs> this whole SST program is sort of you know designed. By the economics that airlines were initially using, the idea was this was going to reduce costs and increase profits. And instead, it increased costs, but also increased profits. But at mm. no, it became but, like a niche thing instead of the new uh, instead standard. Of, instead of the new standard, yeah. Um, and then it got worse. Uh, can I do this one? Yes. I please. wrote it all. Okay. This is Concorde Air France Flight 4590. And uh, it hit parts on takeoff from a previously departed DC 10. So the problem because was. DC 10s love just dropping shit on the runway. Oh, God. Weight yeah, savings, they, buddy. That's weight they saving, are, yeah. They are the uh, uh, Oldsmobile Cutlass of the Skies. Hey, they just your mouth. <laughs> hey, look, okay. I love Oldsmobile Cutlasses, yeah. but this is. They were, it's true for both counts. Yeah. Um, so the, the shrapnel from the, from the previously departed DC-10 got picked up by the landing gear of the Concorde, flew up into the landing gear, and severed part of the um, landing gear electronic controls and also ruptured the fuel tank. And the leaking fuel tank then exploded because the uh, electricity was just flowing outwards instead of through the wires as it's supposed to. Uh, so the sparks ignited the fuel tank. So you had a wing on fire. You had engines one and two completely out and you barely could control this thing. And the thing that's important to remember with SSTs is they are not meant to fly at subsonic speeds, right? Like the yes. Concorde was stable above supersonic speeds it it doesn't have the flaps doesn't have the it doesn't have the uh, ability to control itself below supersonic flight so it, you're you riding know, there, a big lawn dart at this point yeah basically you're you this is not intended to land in this kind of scenario so the gear won't come up and you're you've got two engines out and your plane is on fire so what do you do and the answer is crash into a hotel um I, I wouldn't, and but it, I'm built different. It, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it, it it killed everyone on board and four people in the hotel, so that means that the DC-10 actually killed people not on the plane, but also people on the ground who oh, had never like even the, thought um, about flying into DC-10. Like, like the like the surgery with a 300% mortality rate. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it very much, um, it just, there was no way to recover from this kind of scenario. And this was in 2000, I think. Um, yeah, and July they, 2000. Yeah, and they ended up scrapping the plane three years later because 9-11 happened, as Alice would gladly point out. Mm -hmm. And uh, You don't want to do 9-11 in a, a, a supersonic plane. You don't want to have to like contend with the risk of, of hijacking in a plane that is fast enough that the Air Force has to worry about their ability to catch it. Yeah, um, jet fuel at that speed melts steel beams. So <laughs> they <laughs> they uh, ended up scrapping the program three years later because also like Airbus wouldn't maintain them anymore. They were just like we're done with the service life of the Concorde, and also like 
<laughs> because tickets were eight thousand dollars, and because only rich people took the Concorde, you can't crash an airplane meant specifically for rich people. No, you know the Concorde was up until this point considered the safest form of air travel. It was considered uh, uh, basically uncrashable. And so then you show that this airplane. <laughs> Wait a second, are you drawing some class parallels to another disaster that we I might am, talk about I at some not, point? I'm not yeah. drawing any class parallels to anything. I'm just saying that you can't kill rich people because they'll get mad. John so, Jacob Astor <laughs> breaks his own window on the Concord and says, "Well, I asked for ice, but this is ridiculous." <laughs> um, so the plane crashed into a hotel and everybody died, and you can't do that. That's no. really what it boils down to. It's just like, if you pay $8,000 for a ticket, you better alive, arrive at your destination alive. Yeah, and, and it's, it, it's like an airframe and a form of airframe that relies on everything until the point where you go supersonic working perfectly. Which yeah, it, 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 the surprising <laughs> thing is, we could kind of do that. We did that for a pretty long time. Um, like oh, this isn't the pilots. A, it was uh, a joy to fly. Yeah, yeah, and this isn't like uh, something where we like we we weathered a lot of small incidents. It like mostly ran incident free, and then the incident that ended that streak is it kills fucking everyone. Mm -hmm. I will say also like there are other aircraft where, and this is mostly notable with Boeing planes because they suck. Um, they can do what's called they a dead now. sick landing. They didn't used to suck. <laughs> I know, they used to be really good. But um, you used to be able to, like with most other aircraft, they have like a 15 to 17 to 1 glide ratio. So your aircraft is coming in, all your engines are dead. And you'll drop 1,000 feet for every 15 to 17,000 feet of glide, which is landable. Yeah, um, like the Gimli glider. The Gimli Glider, no. uh, Scandinavian Airlines Flight 751, where they had an MD-81 that had ice sucked into both engines and they just Ooh. couldn't land it. They, they landed in a forest and everybody lived. Like, you can do that with subsonic aircraft. You cannot do that with the Concorde because it is not designed to fly below supersonic speeds. So you just end up with, like you said, Alice, like a lawn dart. Death. Yeah. Mm. And so you... That kind of killed a lot of the romanticism of supersonic air travel, I feel like, because you had this you had this rich, insulated way to fly where you couldn't die, which was up until the very recent modern era, not something you could count on. And all of a sudden you were just as mortal as everybody else. And that just mm. murdered the the romanticism of the flight. Because you you couldn't just get on board this claustrophobic thin tube but be completely insulated from the realities of air travel. You were just the same as everybody else. Yeah, and I feel like it could have, as a, as a program, supersonic transports could have survived the inevitable crashes, because like one of these was going to happen eventually, just oh, by the yeah. nature of like human factors well, and whatever. And the other but, thing like, too if, is if like... they had been the staple, if they had been the sort of like the thing that had replaced like subsonic jets, then fine, whatever, but like, uh, by positioning it as this sort of like elite thing, as you say, that's that's absolutely fatal to them. Right. Well, and the other I, thing I too what is you like... Is the, the, you know, have you had the Thunderbirds around with the specialized equipment to save the supersonic jet? You know, <laughs> we were supposed well, to have Thunderbirds too, by now. <laughs> it's just like, Air France was losing a ton of money on these. Like, they mm. had no incentive to keep it going aside from patriotism. Uh, British Airways theoretically made profit, but that's not proven. And uh, so you end up with like the same kind of not proven. <laughs> yeah, you end up with the same kind of capitalist realities that like ruins everything. Which is that if they are not making a ton of money on it, they're not going to do it. And mm. Air France was like, it was super easy in '03 for them to say as they're hemorrhaging money, and 9/11 is making no one want to take an airplane again to cancel these. So that just ended it right there. And now they're in museums. In museums. Yes. Yep. You can you can go and see them. I've been on one. The, yeah. It's cool. You, you go see you the future. Look the at museum. the thing. You can, you can you can stick your head in the cockpit and see the like gigantic panel of like uh flight engineer gauges and just be like, man, that's cool. I very much want to go to the uh, Technik Museum Sienheim in Germany, which is like a bucket list item for me. But they have, mm. they're the only museum on earth that has both a Tupolev TU 144 and a Concorde. 
and they'll let you go in them. And I really want to. Uh, I can't drive my van there. That's a problem. <laughs> Damn I, believe, uh, I believe one of the, I forget which museum, there, half of the Boeing 2707 mock-up is preserved somewhere. <laughs> mm. yeah. I will note on this road trip, I visited no fewer than two or three different aircraft museums because I love them. Good choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, shout out to the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, which Ooh. is not a place you should ever go. But mm-hmm. uh, unless like you're going to the Air Force Museum there, <laughs> then support, it's cool. S- support your local S Air and Space Museum. Uh, but also, we never like stopped pitching SSTs. Oh, pitching no. being the key. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Every single one of these sucks. Ass. They're, they're all they're all really bad. I mean, there's a lot of proposals for new SSTs. Um, no one's no one's no one wants to take it seriously. I mean, the only person, the only group that could get an SST going now would be the government, and the government would have to take it seriously. Neither mm. of which things are going to happen, right? No. Yeah. Although I do appreciate the thing that I've put on screen here is uh, one one group has pitched the U.S. Air Force on why don't you make Air Force One, a supersonic plane. This will never happen. <laughs> there are too many vulnerabilities for this to ever be seriously considered. Well, yeah, so they, they fucking land. Yeah, but they managed to like. <laughs> Welcome to Joe Biden's Sky Palace. <laughs> Snowpiercer in the air. They mocked up the thing that will kill Joe Biden and the entire White House press pool at 500 miles an hour when it plunges vertically into terrain. Um, oh, fucking sick. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. I mean, very bad. <laughs> That'd be terrible. <laughs> it's just like I don't know. It's it's like a sort of half remembered retro futurist thing, and it's a it's a compelling, easy way to like crib from ideas that have already been done better by smarter people to make yourself sound smart, and then you don't actually have to do anything because you, you know it's a those. stupid idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, just doesn't, it doesn't seem like. I mean, over the past long time, there's there's been no really serious ideas. I mean, there was the Boeing Sonic Cruiser for a while, and that wasn't that was barely supersonic. I mean, it was mm. it was transonic at best. Um, and then there's there's been nothing. There, there's been no no ideas about speeding up planes, none whatsoever. No one wants to like give give some serious R and D into this, I guess because. Well, I have a thought about why, which is on the next slide, uh, which is that I think there is some interesting stuff happening in in the realm of like hypersonic flight capability. Uh, that is, when you greatly exceed the uh, the speed of sound, like sort of Mach five <laughs> ish. Um, th- this is something that like comes up within the context of like missiles. Putin actually sort of mentioned offhandedly the idea of like a hypersonic missile and got a lot of press in the West where it was like, oh, this, is, this guy is ridiculous, he's joking. Um, Isn't an ICBM in, already hypersonic? Yeah. 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 Also, uh, like in the realm of drones, and I have written here in brackets, ask me what I think about the US Navy UFO videos. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, that's at a point where it's sort of so militarily useful that it does not behoove anyone to talk about airliners is the thing. Um and I mean it's 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 also entirely possible that COVID might just kill the airline industry stone dead before any of this matters. Uh, God please. Mm. <laughs> I oh be sorry. Did that. I say that out loud? You did. <laughs> you traitor. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I I think it's like uh, yeah we're having like this huge narrowing of horizons. Uh, yeah. The world is getting bigger again. Travel is getting harder again. But it's happening in like a less predictable, more chaotic, more stupid way than any of us could have predicted. I'm pretty sure technology is going backwards overall. This is why. Like I, this is why I don't like the uh, I don't like the uh, technological singularity people because it seems fairly obvious to me that actually there's less technology now. Um, you know, everything is just use a computer to coordinate a man a, a in a warehouse better. <laughs> from Ohio on the moon. Yeah. Uh, and that was that was in 1969. That was 52 years ago. Uh, and uh, I don't know, what do you think we're going to be doing in 52 years? 
Well, we're not going to be here, which is really fucking depressing, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Why are you doing like, that's, trip that's now? Part of it. That's it. Was... You wouldn't choose to do a, a cross continental country, country trip, uh, just like askew all forms of home and self at the age of 26, unless you didn't think the world was going to be there when you're 50. And that's like, I mean, I, I'm you know, trying to figure see, out a way to see write the redwoods that. while they're still there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm trying to figure out a way to write that that isn't just super bleak because I love to make my writing have a hopeful note to it. But just like, that's really the underlying purpose of why I take a road trip now. It's like, I don't think any of this is going to be here. I think Sabola, like Sabola has already caught on fire twice since, I don't know, 2000. Like, of course I'm going to go see it before it completely burns down and there's nothing there to see. Uh, it, it's objectively bleak. Uh, so oh, and we're, there's not going to be... back to the vessel again, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, yeah there's not going to be that's... any kind of optimistic future for us. So yeah. that's why I cling to the tuple of TU-144, is it was a promise of a better future that we didn't get. Mm. That's why I have a uh, nine-foot-tall Buran model in my living room. That's currently well, a storage another, unit. Another issue with, uh, you know, uh, supersonic planes and planes in general. It's very hard to square the circle with, you know, planes and climate change. You know, Nobody wants to go back on going on ships for like six months. Right. Well, even I that, would. It's, it would I be very difficult. Yeah, build. I would too. Yes. Try not to murder anybody and then mm -hmm. like start off a murder mystery. Unless you're putting <laughs> nuclear reactors in cargo ships, um, it would be very difficult to build an electric boat yeah, or a sailboat that scales up to the kind of capacity that supports the modern economy. There right? is some well, that's some cruelty. With Amazon, right? Is that like yeah. how how hard is the two day shipping Pandora's box going to be sort of to put back in? And I don't mm. I don't know if it's even possible. Because there's a, there's a, there's a sort of, real, it's the there's easy, a real like cruelty. my consumer behavior doesn't yeah. doesn't really matter. Like the, you know, whatever the hundred companies, seventy one percent carbon emissions or whatever it is. Yeah, it's very difficult as a consumer to like, you know, feel like you matter and material goods and buying stuff feels good and like, you know, there's all the like Roz, you've said like a sustainable world doesn't have two day shipping and that's true, but like. It's really hard to sort of square that circle when there's so little to look forward to and everything yeah. feels so fucking dreadful. There's also there's this cruelty, right, in having like grown up and lived in a world which had had shrunk so dramatically. Uh like the the closest thing to like a, a big technological advancement on the scale of like the moon landing or whatever was the internet, right? Which we 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 grew up having. Um and it has enabled us to sort of to make these connections. Like I, I work with you guys across the Atlantic, um, and you know, like I, I know people. I have friends all across the world. That it's like it's one of the reasons why I think lockdown has like why quarantine has hit people so hard is the realization that oh, you can just have a great deal of this stuff just like yanked back away from you very easily. Yes. Uh, I think the other thing too it, is like That's why I'm so fucking pissed that I can't be at the live show, right? It's like <laughs> The other thing I don't too know, is like man, I feel I don't want to be on the end of a webcam forever. There's a there's a book called Blue Highways that was written I forget by who, but it was written in like the seventies or eighties. And it was about the same kind of road trip that I'm taking today, where I try to avoid highways. I try to eschew normal locations in favor of just the the off the beaten path. And but the idea of doing that without the internet, the idea of doing that without Google Maps to bail me out when I'm stuck, um, is fucking terrifying, but also so cool. Like the the just the amount of wonder and bewilderment you must have faced in in a world where you had a paper map and pay phones is so cool. We can't go back to that. There's no there's no putting that back in the box. Like I have a cell phone. And I have an internet connection pretty much anywhere I go, and I can figure out where my next national park is going to be them and sleep at or whatever. Um, but there's a romanticism to that, and right. SST is like that. Like we know now that it, it's more efficient, it's more economical to make you suffer for twelve hours on a transcontinental flight, but. There was an era where that wasn't the solution. There was an era where 
it was better to give you a plane that promised to literally break the bounds of gravity and physics. And, and you can feel this you can feel this way about being trans too, as I do, for instance, because I have often joked that things were less overtly transphobic in the 1950s, because then you could simply be oh, yeah. a newspaper headline where it was like uh, local like XGI now stacked and they Chris put print like two bombshell, pictures. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah like the side to side. is exactly yeah. that example. She was absolutely like a trendsetter in that regard and it wasn't like accessible to everyone or even like most people but no it was like there was a, a, a distinct kind of ignorance where it was like wow isn't science amazing Make, <laughs> making men into dames incredible what will <laughs> I mean, they think it, of next <laughs> it was really like it was mccartney that ruined everything mm. i mean the lavender scare is really what set us all back and then the aids pandemic Welcome also, to so Well There's Your Problem, a podcast where three communists and an anarchist try to work out where we're taking the time machine with the Glock to <laughs> fucking set us Joe back McCartney's on the right office. timeline. Certainly Joe McCartney's office. <laughs> <laughs> Joe McCartney's office and like Adolf Hitler. They're well, my two. Y'all are saying, uh, y'all said McCartney when it's M McCarthy. No, we're going to kill McCarthy. Paul McCartney. We're going to kill Paul McCartney. <laughs> I know who I'm talking about, Ross. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, fuck you, Wings. <laughs> Goddamn, if one hadn't been released, we would all be living in peace. <laughs> I don't know, it's probably like, I don't know, do the like butterfly theory, it's probably something as obscure as that, you know. Christ, uh, well, I, yeah. I mean, okay, we've done a podcast where we've made yeah. uh, all of the listeners cry. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. Remember the future? I'm, oh wait, was yeah, that my goal? Yeah, remember the future. I think that was our goal, but we can still okay. be sorry. I'm still what? sorry. I always try to be uplifting, like that's the thing is, like, Having a, having we'll, a we'll definitely platform? get you back on for a more uplifting episode of our disaster podcast. Yeah, right? Like yeah, you knew you knew the job was dangerous when you took it. I know. <laughs> I know. I just I always try to end my stories on uplifting note. And like there is no uplifting note here. Everything sucks. There, there is a solution. There is oh an boy. uplifting note. This transatlantic yes. tunnel. Yes. 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 Finally. We gotta build Trains. the transatlantic tunnel. This is the only way you can have high speed, supersonic, electric transportation. You gotta just build the goddamn VAC trains. And I don't mean the Elon Musk bullshit. I mean proper fucking VAC trains. You mean you don't want to take a Model X to Las Vegas? It should be. <laughs> um, it, it, we should build the transatlantic tunnel and it should be like 25 minutes from New York to London. All right. This this no. is this is how the future is going this is, to be. This is why, yeah. This is the future we were promised. It's why uh, it makes sense for you to be able to have like eight girlfriends in different countries on Twitter, is yes. that you can see them by like going on a train for twenty five minutes. Exactly. Build so, the fucking vac train. Build the vac train. You put a guy on the moon. You can build like a, a, a train a and a tunnel that sucks. That's easy. You can yeah, do that. Exactly. It's all pre. All it takes segments. is concerted political effort and will to make the world a better and more livable place. Oh, we're all fucked. It aren't only we? requires mm -hmm. two countries: the United States and Great Britain. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can do maybe we can do like Canada and Ireland. I don't know. <laughs> I hate this place. My God. All right. Well, we're gonna do a segment on this podcast that we have called Safety Third. All right, handwritten notes. Today, today is a printed notes. Printed Still notes. Though. Today is a um, theater themed safety third. Oh no, theater people terrify me because, like, all of the like non acting theater personnel we've talked about this before are like terrifying, terrifying people who have like. Because like theaters collect knife guys. Yes. Uh, they're like, yeah, I, I I actually need this 
absolutely menacing looking folding machete, which I'm going to unfold in front of you for my job, dropping, uh, you know, 200 pound sandbags on top of people all day. Oh, they all have the most insane knives, but they're like harmless people. Yeah. yeah. One of my girlfriends <laughs> is a theater tech. So yeah, that's why I like about her. <laughs> <laughs> Go to horny jail and you get a sandbag dumped on you. <laughs> No comment. Some some elaborate, um, some kind of elaborate, uh, phys- physically punishing but very comedic uh, series of rope of mishaps. Um, <laughs> I've been there. Speaking of which, that's today's safety third. <laughs> Hello to the WTYP crew. I have Go a story fuck yourself. about. <laughs> <laughs> Be nice to the people who submit safety thirds. Well, we depressed him is the thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a story about how I narrowly escaped death. I don't think I've come closer since. I am well out of this career now and for good reason. My bachelor's degree is in theater with a concentration in lighting design. As an undergrad, I did some lighting technician overhire at high school theaters and local professional theaters. I would be part of an overhire crew that would go into a space and, with the help of the permanent staff, change over the theatrical lighting to the designer's specs for the next show. Fuck that, don't want to do it. I'm not climbing out on a gantry. I'm not going to do that either. Yeah, but someone's got to do I'm not, it. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> in my freshman year, one such job was at a private high school in Connecticut. The crew was myself, my classmate a couple of high school students, and the on-staff technical director, the TD. This was one of my first gigs, and having only done theater in a high school capacity, mostly run by teachers in the English department, I had little conception of what good safety practices look like in the workplace. I did not know which practices to avoid. My classmate, being in a a similar year, was in a similar position. Now, the theater was pretty nice. It had about 400, 500 seats. It had a counterweight system over the stage for flying scenic elements, lighting, and so on. Please see attached diagram. The illustrated I do pers- see attached diagram. The illustrated perspective is from the stage view, looking out into the audience. Right? So you, the seats oh, so are So that's back. stage right. Yeah, the seats the- are back here with all the happy uh-huh. people. Right? right <clears> there they are. There's only three people. This is an unpopular show. Um, <laughs> how it My works. My one woman show has been called stupid and annoying. <laughs> <laughs> how it works. You attach stuff like lights and scenery to the baton. That's, that's this, the, the pipe. You see where the leader goes. I'm just redrawing the existing leader. Um, this is attached to the counterweight arbor. Um, down um, here, down here, bottom right. Oh, counterweight arbor down here. Okay, through a series of cables and pulleys or blocks, right? Uh, pig iron bricks are stacked into the arbor, which runs along lubricated tracks attached to the sidewall. Um, so I, I guess, yeah, L- like an elevator. Um, <laughs> yeah, like an elevator. It was a pulley, right? Yes. right. You can pull on the operating rope to make the batten go up and down, probably 70 feet total, either from the floor or operating galley. There's a lever lock, but those locks, however, have uh, worn brake pads, for a lack of a better term, right? In this case, I guess. Hmm. Now, there's about 30 sets of this in this theater. Uh, The batten that we started with that day had lights on, right? We had replaced them all with a new set. The TD instructs my classmate to go to the operating galley to dog bone that operating line. Excuse me. Right? Well, if you insist. <laughs> Does in parentheses I, here. Back I, to that I can't in a say second. the joke that I want to say because it would be libeling a British Twitter guy. But uh... <laughs> I recently said progesterone, and we shouldn't be using this terminology. <laughs> <laughs> The technical director unlocks the rope rock and shouts on in on 18 mid 
denoting the baton number and rough location on stage. Uh, the students were up near the back wall sorting through the lights we needed. I'm a little bit confused here. So there's a whole bunch of these. Um, okay. Oh, oh, so there's a bunch of them. Oh, I see. Okay, I see this picture here. So the TD pulls in the baton at a steady pace. The arbor pops out, uh, and the baton is about shoulder height. He locks the rope, right? At this point, sure. the procedure should have been, number one, clear the area, unload all weight bricks from that arbor from the loading gallery. The system is batten heavy, but it can't go anywhere. Number two, re remove the lights from the batten, attach new lights. Number three, clear the area and add the weight ne needed weight back to the arbor. The process of adding or removing weight is a normal occurrence, but it grinds all work on stage to a halt as everyone has to leave. So if you don't really care about safety, you can get away with doing one weight change. Enter dog bone. Enter dog bone. The term dog bone, like many things in theater, comes from the maritime field. This modified practice involves taking a short length of iron pipe, sticking it between the two halves of the operating loop, and twisting to make a tension braid, ultimately wedging the pipe against the arbor track. It j just jam a fucking, like, pry bar in there? And twist it around. Uh-huh. And twist it around. It's the most dangerous shit I've ever heard. If you're thinking ballista, yes, my poor ignorant classmate under the direction of an idiot had created one half of one siege weapon. <laughs> Oh my god. It was a Siege Warfare episode that reminded me of this whole thing. Oh yeah, that time I got shot at with a ballista. <laughs> <laughs> I had seen- <laughs> We have such fucking weird listeners, man. <laughs> we think we're weird. We do an episode about siege weaponry, and somebody is like, Oh yeah, I got shot at with one of those. I, I, was, um, I, I was thinking earlier, you mentioned uh, asparagus in reference to mm. Charles de Gaulle. Someone just sent in a safety third about asparagus. So, um, <laughs> thank you, fans. Uh, well, that's the next one. That'll right, be the next freaks. one. Yeah. <laughs> I had seen this practice before, so I thought nothing of it. There are definitely safer strategies to deal with um, out of balance systems, but this one is quick and also very bad. Hmm. Ask me yeah, about my not tape. only can the thing like come loose, drop the drop the baton full of lights on you, but also it can shoot an iron bar out across the stage like chain shot. <laughs> Theaters are now battlefields. <laughs> <laughs> my classmate comes down, we remove uh, half the lights from the baton. The system is probably two hundred pounds out of balance at this point. Uh huh. Some time passes and we hear a metal thunk of the dog bone slipping. Uh -oh. The baton springs up like one of those slingshot rides, which is followed by the intense rushing sound of the arbor dropping at top speed. The baton hits the loft blocks up at the top. Uh, no grid structure here is depicted in the diagram. And the arbor bot bottoms out against the, stru the supporting structure of the system followed lastly by a shower of glass shards from the remaining lights. Nice. Everyone but my classmate was away from the action, but he had the good sense to leap away quickly. Nobody was injured, but definitely shaken a fair deal. Um, the force of the arbor bent the bottom supporting structure downward a good couple inches, and there were horizontal wooden bumper rails that the arbor sits on in the lowest position. They were thoroughly crushed and splintered upwards. Um, the top half of the arbor sagged forward, slightly bent. Nice. The day should have ended right there, but we hadn't had enough fun yet. Remember, oh, no. kids, hit the bricks. <laughs> <laughs> My memory is very fuzzy at this point. The next thing I remember is seeing the technical director absolutely tear into the arbor base with a hand grinder in attempt to but, free it from the mangled metal but, of the bottom but, structure. But, but when you free it, it's gonna, it, it's gonna come up in the... Alice, don't think about it. Wait, so I'm, I'm a little bit confused here. Is the, so, so the, okay, so 
the batten is up and the arbor is back down, right? Yes. Okay. Right. He alternated. It's wedged in there in the bottom. He's trying to cut it free. He's trying to but cut if he it does free. cut it free, uh, my my concern here is that it is going to like fly up, and this man is going to get hit in the face with a a thing full of like pig iron bricks. Good point. Yeah. Well, he alternated between taking weight off the arbor and grinding. Oh, so if it wasn't heavier before, or wasn't lighter before, it is slowly becoming lighter. Yes. The rest of us were sticking to the back wall. I left to go to the bathroom and came back. Uh, the door was out by the left side wall and roughly in the same plane as the batten. There was about six feet of space between the left side wall of the stage and the end of the battens, so you can walk along the walls and be safe. I relieved myself and came back through the door. I was aware to stick to the wall, but at the moment I stepped through the threshold, the arbor came free. The TD had taken weight off, so the system was now batten heavy. Cue another rush of arbor travel. As the batten flew downwards at such speed that the landing curtains couldn't prevent it from bottoming out. When it did, it came within four to five feet of my skull before bouncing slightly and coming to a definite rest. More glass uh, shattered and came loose from the lights. I was frozen in place, and the technical director was enraged. Again, miraculously, no one was injured. Everyone walked away unscathed that day. Sorry, but this 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 reader this uh, this reader did survive a sort of hitman assassination mm-hmm. opportunity here. Mm-hmm. I was about. Have to you say. wronged this technical director in some way <laughs> that you're aware of? You, you're causing a, a comical sort of Looney Tunes theater death. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Getting an entire light rig dropped directly on your head. After having it almost murder you on the way up, it almost murders you on the way down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the theater director became, excuse me, technical director became preoccupied with trying to clean up his own mess at this point, probably panicking about getting fired over the potentially criminal levels of negligence he displayed. My classmate and I told the students they should leave immediately. We then go- do the same and we never went back. (laughs) A few hours after writing this story, my dad called me and told me that according to the state treasury department, I was, I am owed roughly $200, $250 to back pay for this very gig. (laughs) Probably because I was too shook to go back and pick up my check. I'm still pretty spooked about that phone call, but I assure you, I will be collecting my fucking pay. (laughs) Cheers. No name provided. Labor is entitled to all it creates. And possibly destroys? Who knows? Shake hands yes. for danger. <laughs> um, don't work in the theater. It's don't dangerous. Work, don't work in the theater. It's dangerous. One, one of the, one of the most... feel really great about my girlfriend that works in the theater. Thanks. Which is probably a more, more, more dangerous to others than she is to herself. Mm-hmm. It's like Um, sharks, you know, they're more scared of you than you are of them. Yeah. So, um, our next episode is on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Disaster. Does anyone have the commercials before we go? Uh, we have a live show. You can, you can pay money to get into the, the, the live stream for it. Yeah, you can't get into the show because we are sold out. But that's right. Probably would have been a wise decision to announce the show um, well, after the you episode. Weren't coordinating yeah, we would that. Have, we would have. We would have sold <laughs> yeah. out even faster. Um, yes. Also, I have a podcast called Trash Future. I have a podcast called Kill James Bond. Uh, Tori, where can the people find you? Where can they read your work? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Mikudu Beahina, which is Hell a yeah. terrible Twitter name. But uh, they can find me there. They can find me at thedrive.com. I'm writing a story called The Van's Continental Express. And that's my series about traveling across the U.S. in a right-hand drive Toyota van, um, which is why I'm currently broadcasting from a backyard in L.A. because my van broke because I drove up a mountain and then broke it. Um, (laughs) I'm also at Jalopnik Hemmings Motor One. I have an article going live at Automotive Map. My personal website is trustthemachine.com. There's oh, yeah. a lot of places you can find Thanks me. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Oh, it was, was my pleasure. Say, oh, my God. Send me all those links so I can put them in the description. 
legitimately, <laughs> like I, uh, so on this road trip, I mostly listen to music. Oh, well, I'm driving from the American West because I don't have a lot of cell signal. I mean, like this is mostly a solitary trip taken without, you know, modern conveniences. That's the whole goal. Um, but mm. I do listen to this podcast a lot, so it was really, truly an honor to be on. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, thank you for coming. Oh, yeah. Thank you for coming oh, on. It was a good pleasure. episode. It was fun. My pleasure. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little bit reticent about having to listen to this episode because I have to hear my own voice. That's all I feel uh, all the time, buddy. <laughs> Don't worry. It doesn't get any better. No, I know. That's really a trans woman thing, though. It's like, I have to hear my voice. And it's like, Again, I've been training this shit for it. six months, and <laughs> it is not anymore, like, passable. Shut so the I'm fuck gonna... up. You sound great. Cut her mic. Uh, Cut her mic, <laughs> please. You know, what, uh, you, know, you know what? You know what? I got, I got another depressing note to end on. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. The last remnant of the SST era was. The Seattle Supersonics. <laughs> Who ironically became the Oklahoma City Thunder. In 2008, yes. <laughs> Man, that really is ironic. <laughs> <laughs> they outlasted the Concord. And, and in the city, with the, the sonic booms, they became the Oklahoma City Thunder. That's like a fucking John Boyce level of like yes. uh, <laughs> tying it back together. One Man. of the few authors that I truly like has inspired me on this trip. John Boyce I'm actually John planning. Bois. John Bois. I'm planning to go to Seattle to go to the, uh, the old Marliners, Mariners, Mariners. Mariners Stadium. Yeah, that, that wherever they got the... the the uh, metal baseball player at a Lowe's where they bent yeah. back the bat. That's yeah. where I'm planning to go. I already did my homage to um, Hunter S. Thompson when I mm. blew out my alternator on top of a mountain, had to drive home with no headlights at 11 <laughs> p.m. There. Yeah. So I figured this uh, when I get to, uh, when I get to Seattle, I'll make a John Boy uh, homage. Oh, so yeah. We'll see if I can do it. Uh, John Boyce, as in W E B. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce his name. We'd love to get him John on the show. Boy. John Boy. <laughs> John Boy. If he's ever on the show, invite me again just so I can say hi and then just cut my feed. <laughs> uh, Alice and right. Roz, we have serious business after we uh, cut. Okay. So. Well, in that, that case, that serious, is it? No, uh, fuck. No, it's not that serious. <laughs> uh, Liam's leaving the show. We're replacing him with Joe Kasabian. Um, <laughs> jokes right. on you motherfucker i am joe kasabian i'm oh, joke fuck. kasabian right i i've become jo joe kasabianified all right i've grown right. two inches and i'm covered in tattoos by my book yeah. uh it's available yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah by joe kasabian's book actually all right all right bye everybody we, we have done the bye. podcast good night everyone bye thanks for me on <laughs>